I think what I see a lot <clears throat> for guys is, and I've done it personally, is I'll I like to release the heat from the meat, so I'll I'll skin it out. We're gonna, but we gotta coin that. I like really, to release the heat release from the, the meat. Heat from the meat. <laughs> that could be a t-shirt. Yeah, Nick, <laughs> look, Nick, put that down for our t-shirt ideas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4 800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back it's going to be a great looking food plot for anybody that's looking to try deer grow if you use the code hunter15 that's h-u-n-t-r-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com and save 15 percent on any of your deer grow products it's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself better food plots bigger deer and we're back hey you on our podcast episode 145 as nick keeps us in line yeah, thank you, Nick. As always, if you guys like our stuff, give us a like, follow, subscribe on Instagram, YouTube. Nope, not Instagram. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you know, wherever you guys listen to podcasts, give us a follow. We follow, pre- like. We appreciate it. Yes, we do appreciate it. And we've got an in-guest. In-studio in guest. In-studio <laughs> guest. Jeez. <laughs> if we could get our work We're struggling today. today. It's early. Yeah. Yeah, <sighs> in-studio guest. Yeah, hey, Trav. Trav. Trav's hey. taxidermy. Trav's taxidermy. Travis Good to be here. Yeah. Is that is that the official name? Trav's taxidermy? Yeah. Trav. Trav's taxidermy. Everybody calls me Trav, so yeah. yeah. That's Trav's taxidermy. Yep. Our taxidermist. <laughs> m- yeah. Most important. I saw us telling Trav and you guys before we started. It's like, did, when it comes to taxidermy, and I think bow shops are the same way, and you know, butcher, whatever you want to, yeah. you got to have a guy. Like mm-hmm. you got to have, you know, it's not just like you, you go online. It's like online service. You know, it's like you have to have a relationship with your taxidermist, right? Yeah. I've been like, even yeah. on these deer. So I just got back from North Dakota, right? And we got, we got a buck to, to take care of here. And so I was like texting you in the airport and stuff. I'm like, Hey dude, how do I, is this velvet? Can I take care of it this way? And, um, so it's been nice to have you kind of helping me with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely something a lot of guys, uh, a lot of guys like a good relationship with the person they're doing work with. And yeah, mm-hmm. it's just the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, yep. there's a lot of things like that. Obviously, like you said, bow shops, taxidermists, think of like anytime we talk about like our electrical guy or our HVAC guy on our buildings, like Huge. Y- you need a guy a professional. That, like well, a, you just can rely on because the, you know, you don't want to just hand it over and be like, oh, I don't even know if this is going to be done right. It's those services that require like craftsmanship. Yep. Yeah. Like you said, H- H- even on our buildings and stuff, HVAC mm-hmm. guys. But when it comes to hunting, the, the you know, the bows certainly need to be tuned right and the taxidermy needs to be done well. You don't want to, I mean, there's nothing worse than, you know, I've got a few that I look at. Uh, now, Same. now that I've got Trav doing Same. mine, I look at some of my older ones and I'm like, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, I thought it was good until I put it next to this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one over here that looks like it got run over by an 18 wheeler <laughs> and then stretched onto it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but I mean, that's the thing is I, I feel like, um, well, I kind of related even to like the deer processor side a little bit is like, it, it seems like there's less and less taxidermists every year. Um, you know, or at least for a long time there, it'd be like, oh, so-and-so does taxidermy, so-and-so. It just, it doesn't seem like you have that much concentration of taxidermist anymore um, from a choice standpoint. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That I, I talk to guys all the time and like, especially older guys, there's tons of guys that used to do that just as a hobby. You sure. Know, just as a part-time hobby. And it seems like those guys are just dropping off, you know, and then a lot of taxidermists are older and uh, yeah, they're just stopping. Yeah. You know, some of them are you know, just disappearing and, and there's just not much left of it. So there's not a lot of young guys anymore. Yeah. yeah. What you do know? you think is the main reason for that? Like what, what is causing people not to like get into that side of it? Man, I don't know. I mean, I guess 
a lot of it is, I mean, there, there was a lot of guys back, you know, back in the day that, uh, they just, they, they were just more, they just, they were, they were more craftsman type, mm -hmm. type people. And I think the younger generation, maybe they, they don't just pick up and just do random stuff sure. like guys, like the older type of people did. Yeah. You know, like your dad, you know, just doing Jack, being a Jack of all trades. Yeah. seems like the younger, the younger generation doesn't really pick up stuff like, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. And then, you know, part of it too is, uh, you know, younger guys, they're, everybody's more business minded nowadays mm -hmm. and they're not really willing to really work for free anymore. Sure. And, uh, a lot of those older type guys, they just kind of did it as a hobby they and they did didn't it. care yeah. if they made money. At Their buddies, the year yeah, and stuff. Just kind of goofed off with it. And it just, it doesn't happen as much anymore. Hmm. So in a yeah. way it's kind of, a, and you've, I'm sure got your finger on the pulse much more than I do, but it seems like nowadays, like if you're a taxidermist, like it's for a reason, like it's, that's, you're focused yeah. on that. Yeah. That's what you do. You do it well. Like you, you almost can't even take on any more business, right? Because you're, everybody wants to come to you. I'm driving yeah, from Pennsylvania yeah. and same with my bow shop. I drive an hour yeah. and a half to go to my, that's my guy. Yeah. Um, and I would definitely agree like those, cause I used to go to, to a guy that kind of did it on the side and like he did, don't, don't get me wrong. Like it was, it was, it was great. He still does like some of our guys mounts and stuff. So not to discredit him at all, but I think it's kind of a, it's a side deal, you know, and yeah. he's been doing it for a long time, but the guys that I see killing it now are like, that's, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think the, the craftsmanship thing is a, a, a big point. And, and part of that I think is just kind of the way things are now. But so for instance, like think about if you get a new vehicle now, you pop the hood, it's electrical and computers and all that, you know, back in the day, like I'd have, whatever 1990 ford ranger like i could literally and i'm not handy i'm not a craftsman i could pop the hood and i could do things with that engine like i could see everything there wasn't computers all over the place like <laughs> well, wires on but yeah i mean you, you just it was it, things were simpler back then and so to your point i think trav about like kind of the jack of all trades is like yeah you know if i needed new brakes like my dad would put new brakes on and stuff it wasn't because he was an auto mechanic he just he just knew how to put brake pads on and things like that he knew how to bleed the brakes and I don't think anybody's doing, uh, you know, that kind of stuff in the younger generations now. Yeah, maybe just in general, people knew how to do stuff back in the day. We just all know how to, I don't know if it's, we know less, but like, it seems like people are more focused, like we, they do certain things, like mm -hmm. more specialized, less jack of all trades, like you said. Well, see, that's what I was going to ask about the, the taxidermy side is, uh, on the flip side, think about all the content, things like YouTube and stuff that we have now to learn how to do taxidermy or, or online classes to learn how, like it used to be all in-person stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it would almost seem like you have more resources to learn how to do that if you wanted to. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, unbelievable what's on, what's out there right now to learn taxidermy. Like if I would have had that when I started, like I would have been so excited, but yeah. Yeah. That stuff wasn't out there then. How did you get into, like, who taught you how to do taxidermy? So, I, my dad actually, I mean, a lot of older guys, if you listen to the podcast, you'll, you'll uh, recognize the Northwestern School of Taxidermy. It's a little set of booklets or whatever that a lot of the older guys had. And my dad actually had that in on the bookshelf. And I, I pulled those out and started reading through them. And that's literally what got me started. Mm. And I started fooling around with stuff, skinning birds and different stuff like that. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, my mom actually bought me a legit course then for Christmas one year. Oh, wow. And, uh, and that was an in-person course? No, this is booklets. Oh, this is yeah, booklets. Like so booklets. you read and you look at pictures. I skinned my first deer by looking at pictures, picture to picture. Mm. Wow. Skin, figuring it all out, yeah. I, I, I that, definitely dude. learned the hard way, which I think was a good it's thing. because the best thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, you it, probably it made some you. mistakes, then you realized what you did, and you went back and forth. Like, I mean, that's that's how you learn. Like, that's yeah. how you get better at things. You learn to improvise a lot, you know, and just figure things out, and uh, rather than just having you somebody show you step by step. And, hmm. you know, Dude, those old books and booklets don't get brought up enough. Like, it's once you, it's funny once you kind of get a spark for something, like whether it's it's uh, you know taxidermy. For me, I can relate to on like the, on the trapping side. I remember the same thing. Like when I started getting interested, I was like, I bought every book that I could, and they were yeah. all written by those old trappers. And in your case, you know the the mm -hmm. you know the old taxidermists. Yeah, like stuff, the but. Tom Miranda trapping stuff is what I what I was looking at back then. Yeah. You know, he had old school VHS or DVDs, he had books out, like mm -hmm. that's what you were reading through yeah, and looking at pictures. And, and to your point, Trav, you're improvising because you're looking at this and it's subjective. It's however you think that, you know, trap's supposed to be set or in, in the case of skinning an animal or deer or whatever. Like you're having to improvise a little bit because 
all you're seeing is whatever you can interpret. Mm -hmm. And I promise for the best because it's like you said, it's a it's a skill. It's requires craftsmanship. No, nobody does it exactly the same, right? So yeah. it's like you kind of learn the basics and then develop a style and then perfect it and turn it into something that people are yeah. trying to model it after. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely one thing about taxidermists. Everybody's got their own their own style, their own look. Like, I mean, I can look at your deer on the wall. I, that guy, I've never seen his mounts, but I mean, I can take one look at that and I know exactly who mounted it. That's yeah. so it's just, crazy. It's insane. Like, yeah, I, you know, at the, at the <laughs> competitions or whatever, usually about, I don't know, 75% of them or so I can kind of go through there and ah, I think he mounted that one, you know? Wow. And, uh, you can pick, you how can do you describe something like that? Like, would you say, oh, I have a style that's like this or as opposed to, uh, not really. I no? mean, it's just a look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how they do their eyes and, and the different eyes. things like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what else? I'm sure there's like key features that stick out. Like you, you mentioned the eyes are done a certain way. Or yeah. I mean, everybody's kind of got their, you know, their, their different things. Like I know like one lady at the competition, she, the way she does her faces and stuff, like gives it that bull look kind of builds do laps underneath and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Just using the clay and stuff yeah, to build. Yeah, exactly. And, and everybody's kind of got their look that they like. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. trying to think things that have stood out to me that I noticed. I mean, I've, I, I only look at a handful of them, you know, on a regular basis, but I, I think I noticed, uh, you know the the necks like especially like you you like a really muscular neck uh-huh not yeah. not big but like really def a lot of definition Defined. in the neck yeah. mm -hmm. which i love i'm all about especially with them early season highs a lot I'm of customers like, do like that and that's yeah. kind of the reason i'm like yeah. that deer's freaking ripped yeah. i'm like yeah i shot a beast <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it can be overdone but yeah well, well, that's what no we talk doubt. about like those kansas bucks and stuff that you know i mean when you see a, a mature kansas buck in full rut i mean that thing he looks like a power lifter yeah. i mean he's just stacked yeah yeah I have seen those mounts that you're talking about where they're over down where it looks like the head is just put onto like a, a like a, a log. Like a, <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like that deer couldn't breathe. <laughs> uh, straight steroids. Um, it, it is funny. So I guess when you say like styles and stuff, and I don't know, I'm trying to think how to, are there like just in any uh, service or craftsmanship or, you know, artistry, are there like certain people you're like, this guy, like people just recognize that name as like, like he's just a top of the line taxidermist type of thing. Or is it like as a group and community, like you guys appreciate everybody fairly equally. You all have your own style. Yeah. I mean, there, there is that, but there's definitely, there are definitely guys that you, you see their work and you know, you hear their name, like it's automatically a, oh, wow. Yeah. He's at the top of his game Wow, for sure. Yeah. Who would who would someone like yeah, that it's be? It's funny you're asking about like the the inner network of the yeah. Well, I'm just trying to think, and not like to like of highlight the tax the, like, community. Yeah, I said for even for you, Trav, because obviously I would assume you're a younger guy in the taxidermy business. Is there like, a high table of taxidermy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who who's someone when you hear hear that name, you're like, yeah, that's gonna be a damn good mount. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a long list to be honest with you. It's not yeah. like there's one good, really really good deer guy. There's yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of good deer guys and stuff like that. But I mean. I could start listing people. I'm probably I'll probably miss no, a few. No, you're fine. Like, like I know, like Jenna Everidge, she's really good right now. Like I know the guys that have won the world. You know, like uh, yeah, Vince Blaine's really good, and and on and on you could go. Yeah, so, but East that's Coast just guys a, or what's that? East Coast guys or mid Midwest, yeah, all most Ohio, of Midwest. Yeah. yeah, PA has really good deer taxidermists. I Ohio bet. has really good deer taxidermists. We're really lucky in Ohio. We've got uh, the Epley brothers, uh, mm -hmm. Brian and Epley, yep. and those guys. Um, I've what, heard that. Why does that name sound familiar? Super, what's that? Why does that name sound familiar? Uh, they, they actually, so in Millersburg, I, Miller, they're in Kilbuck now, I guess it would be. Okay. But um, they are sculptors, and uh, in my opinion, like the best, like the best around. And they've, you know, they've brought a lot of knowledge into like our Ohio shows and PA shows and you know mm -hmm. all the states surrounding. So mm. they've uh, they've done a really good job of educating a lot of good taxidermists around the Ohio, PA, Indiana area. Cool. Yep. Um, but yeah, they're, I mean, Brian, I think 14 time world champion in sculpting, you know, so explain, just, explain that to a lot of our listeners. Cause like, it, you know, again, we talk about the subjectiveness around it, but I mean, there is a competition for taxidermy that is actually right. So when you talk about him being a 14 time, you know, world sculpting champ, like what, what are those? Is that just an annual thing? Is it, you know, like a convention type uh, setting. Yeah, there's so there's different st shows. There's state shows, and that's the only shows that I've I've been to. State shows. Um, 
you know, you've got regional shows. Um, world, the world show is kind of mm-hmm. like the top dog. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, it's, I want to say every two years, there's, it's in Ohio, uh, in the States here, then it goes overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really big show, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and, and there's not tons and tons and tons of taxidermists in the States. So right. And a state show might have, uh, I don't know, hundred pieces, maybe 200, mm-hmm. um, in it. So that's not like, it's not a huge deal, but yeah, it's, hmm. it's kind of a, kind of a cool place. Yeah. And you've, yep. you've placed well at some of those or competed yeah, or I, entered stuff into them or. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the state show or whatever. Yeah. I, I mean, I've won a lot of different awards. They give, they give quite a few awards out, but yeah, I mean, I guess I could nail it down to like a couple of the ones, you know, that I, I value or whatever, like taxidermist choice award is one that I kind of value because it's all your, all your buddies, you know, they vote on their favorite mount, you know, in the show. Oh, wow. Um, so that's a cool one. Uh, most artistic entry in the show is a cool one. I've I've got that one, and then uh, state champion would be like so they they give a state champion medallion for uh, white the best white tail, and then the best game head, and the best fish. And, and wow! Mm-hmm. So at one tail. at one time you had the best white tail in the state. They give you an award for that. Yeah, yeah. That's I awesome. I did. Uh, I got the That's best huge, white man. tail and the best game head before. So. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So I assume there's like it, it, is there a certain species that you favor like are you would you consider yourself like hey i'm a whitetail guy or it's gotta be right <laughs> yeah i mean because <laughs> i mean i assume you mount waterfowl or you know other yeah, things I, too i do not do waterfowl anymore and i i pretty much have been kind of leaning towards just basically furred animals and mm-hmm. animals for, at this point yeah i do a few turkeys yet but not not very many fish but I, I I did my neighbor's fish. Um, Don't tell anybody, but, but yeah, that, that's yeah. a fish. Yeah. It's kind of one of those deals. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I used to do quite a few yeah. of them. The but fish yeah, thing to seems tough, right? Because, I mean, that's a lot of just airbrushing, right? Yeah, it's, it's Built totally... Built from scratch, basically. It's totally re... Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I do a lot of skin mounts, but yeah, skin, reproduction, you know, yep. you're, you're starting from scratch when it comes to painting them. But yeah, furred yeah. animals, per- preferred. So yeah, yeah. deer, and elk. I, I'm, not, I'm not the type of guy, I don't... I get bored doing one thing 24 seven, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just, I mm-hmm. can't handle just mountain deer all year long. So I like to bounce around a little bit. Sure. Um, so as far as one animal that I really like, I do like deer. They're, they're up there close to the top, but, um, yeah, I, all of the life size stuff. I, I love that. Some of the African stuff. Oh, really? I yeah. wouldn't, none of it I'd want to do all the time, but it's, it's nice and fun to do it every once in a while. Cause I think yeah. the hard thing for a lot of people to, to kind of fathom and even with the deer side of things with CWD and things is like, how, how do we get stuff to you? Like, so you talk about African game or you talk about grizzly bears or whatever. It's like, okay, Trav's in Ohio. I shoot this grizzly bear in Alaska. Like how the hell do I even get it to you? Yeah. Well, I I've got, honestly, I've got customers all over the place. I mean, Montana, um, South Carolina, hmm. North Carolina. Yeah. All, all different States. Um, so yeah, as far as, as far as that goes, I mean, you can ship frozen stuff. A lot of guys ship frozen stuff. And then a lot of guys have buddies that live close and they yep. just drive it in. Yeah. Well, literally we're doing it right yep. now. So I shot that buck in North mm-hmm. Dakota. What's today? Mon Friday. Today's Friday. I shot him Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I'll just share our process for like what what we're doing, and we can critique, say, "Hi, hey, I would do it this way. I do it a little differently." So we fortunately made a great shot on that thing, and we recovered it within an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a drag job, so drug it out to the truck and took it right back to um, to the house where we got it. So I got it caped out yep. within maybe three hours of, of shooting it, which is why you're dragging ass because it was a late night. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was like, we crashed it. We got to bed at two 30 yeah. and I woke up at five 30 for my flight the next day. Yeah. It was on maybe the next podcast. I'll, I'll give you the full breakdown of, of the hunt or mm-hmm. whatever if later we want to get into it. But, um, yeah, I got back yesterday. I flew back yesterday. So yeah, yeah I'm dragging a little bit, but where am I? So we got, so we got him caped out to the neck. And so, you know, we, so Lucas kind of, I let him do, he, he's just had, a, you know, not his first rodeo. Yeah. So he was just going at it. He freaking skinned the whole thing, like b- bottom to top, tubed everything. So I got no cuts down anything. We're, we're tubed down. Yeah. Well. Um, so you got a lot to work with, right? And uh, all the way to the neck, you know, cut it off. And then we left it and the, um, you know, the rest of the, the carcass and stuff hanging in a cooler. So he's got a meat cooler that's overridden. It's just an AC unit that's mm-hmm. overridden by the, 
whatever that cool little butt thing. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like within a matter of you know twenty minutes, the thing was down to forty degrees. Took the old restrictor plate off her neck. Yeah, the old red lemmers. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we got it in the cooler, you know, right away. I felt really good about how we handled all that. Even while we were dragging it out, one comment that he made was we made we were conscious about holding his head high because we're dragging across tough mud and stuff sure, yeah. so I, I didn't want to rip yeah. up yeah good good for him rip up yeah. all of his chest and um he's pretty much in fall coat at mm, this point pretty much yeah pretty much I noticed a little bit a of little summer patch. couple patches yeah. couple yeah. patches well dude that deer was in velvet I saw him Sunday Sunday morning three mornings before Really? Yeah, so, Sunday morning you texted me because yeah, I was so, scouting out. So Sunday morning he was full pristine velvet, and then by Wednesday night he was ninety eight percent shedded out, and like a half mile away, and a half mile away. Yeah, which I think was more because of pressure than like a shift or sure. something. Sure. Yeah. So okay, so you got everything. Got him back out. to the cooler and everything, mm-hmm. and then the next day, so you know whatever it is, twenty four hours mm-hmm. later, we had him at uh, Lucas's taxidermist out there to. You know, I can cape a deer out, and so and so can Lucas. But I mean, if I have a taxidermist, dude, like when I watch your your brother do it and stuff, like get my skull cap out and stuff, it's like I, I just better let him do it. I mean, usually <laughs> we're like nine beers deep in Kansas because we have to cape everything out, yeah. and it's like at some point we're like, okay, let's just start. Yeah. If anything, the beers <laughs> give me a steady hand, but I, you know, I just you know I want to make sure it's done right. And I mean, yeah. it's just, it it probably for us is what like an hour or two process, and I assume for like maybe yeah. Your brother, it's probably like, are you guys? Oh, dude, your like, brother can knock him out in what, 15, 15 minutes? 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's pretty <laughs> impressive. Fun to watch. I'm Every once in a while, I offer to help him. He's going, hold antlers. He's like, I got it. I got yeah. it. You know? I'd be looking like Jared with the missing finger if I was trying to do it in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so we got him back to the cooler, got him, you know, caped out to the neck, took him to the tax service the next day. He finished caping him out. Um, he's going to deep freeze the hide. So I guess um, I, I, I didn't specify, but I guess it's fur out, right? Yeah, yeah that's usually maybe, the best way. Probably rolled up in a garbage bag or something mm-hmm. in the freezer. Yeah. Um, so we'll get a hard freeze so he can. Sh- he's going to put that in a, I don't know, it's not styrofoam, but one of those shipping containers. Yeah. Shipping yeah. coolers. Shipping mm-hmm. coolers, and he'll put dry ice in or fill it with dry ice, and then overnight it to you mm-hmm. is what he's doing. And then I don't know what you're going to do with it from there, but put it in the freezer, send, send it off to your guy at some point. How do yeah. you ship them yeah. out of your place? So they're... Basically, any hide that gets shipped from me, I will salt it ahead of time. And that's... Are you flushing it at at all? Yeah, well, well? it'll totally be flushed out, salted, and dried. For just Um, a a transparency sake, let's say Jared basically ships you this. What's the process when you receive it? You, you There's the package. I am. It's coming. You'll have it. So, two, so two on a green hide like that, I have my tannery do, does the flushing at this point okay. right now. Um so I will drive it to the tannery. Okay. Um, I go there every two weeks or oh, so. Oh, it's that. How far is it from you? Uh, it's in Mount Eaton. Yeah. I'm Down sure in Mount Eaton area. Yeah. Ohio. It's an Amish guy. Oh, okay. Yep. So you're yeah. driving it to that tannery. Yep. Where they're going to flush it. And that's going to get turned and salted and tanned. And then when I get it back, we'll basically <clears throat> have to thin everything out and then it's ready to mount. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And when you talk about the thinning side, what, what process is that? include from your end so it's about an hour's worth of work okay um uh basically the lips and the eyes you want that skin really nice and thin Mm -hmm. so that basically all the detail and there's no shrinkage there's less shrinkage then if it's thin um nose and eyes and then the ears you have to peel the cartilage off and uh that's basically the the most of it and then patch all the you know sew any any broadhead cuts or anything like that in it and uh, usually I run the necks on my flushing machine. I have a flushing machine there in the shop, and uh, that just gives me an, a little bit more stretch and workability in the neck part. But that's basically what we have to do to it after it gets back from the tannery. And I would assume that probably the the most issues that you as a taxidermist face is people not treating that hide appropriately mm-hmm. before it comes to your Shop. Yeah, it, yeah. So I described to you my process. Where where could we have gone wrong with that? Like where where do guys go wrong? Where hair starts slipping and the hide is because yeah. I, I maybe the, I know I have the guys hair have taken, piece guys have taken hides in and they're like I can't use it. You know, yeah, it's no good. Yeah, yeah. I would say I would say you did pretty good. I mean, other than like for me personally, I wouldn't have even drug it. Like I yeah. wouldn't even try lifting it up, dragging it. Up. I would just quarter Cape it. I don't know if yeah. that's possible in North Dakota, but dude, the mosquitoes is honestly what bit, kept us. I mean, really eating. I yeah. 
We would have got picked up and flown away, you know, <laughs> yeah. basically. Some states, I don't know what their rules and regulations are on quartering a deer out in the field. I think but you can. That's that's what I would have done. You would rather not drag it at all, literally yeah, quarter it quarter out. Yeah, right there. Yeah. I, I literally, I'm so picky Take about it down dragging. to the head and, yeah. and basically, so cape it down to the head and then take everything out? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Pack it out, yeah. In a different situation, if we had had more time or something, even if I'd shot him a day earlier, we, pr- we probably would have. And honestly, on an early season cape, I don't think dragging them is near as bad. Hmm. Like, so the longer the hair gets, um, you know, and, and what you drag it across is sure. it makes a big difference too. Mud and, and rocks and stuff we is We were dragging worst. on some tough stuff. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the worst. Real, because, like, uh, what's it, it, essentially you describe like a mud flight, you know, but it's just like a, a, cr- it's a big dry. cracked, cr- you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. or so Crusty. Yeah. Yeah. But we really, we're trying to be intentional. Yeah. About, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, you, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's probably fine if you were careful. But, yeah, the main thing is, like, so deer hair is hollow, mm-hmm. and when you're dragging it, it can literally be wearing the tips of the hair off. And then, so say you drag it across mud, mud will work its way up into the hair follicle. Oh, wow. And you literally can't get it out. Hmm. You know, if there's blood and, and, and mud and stuff up in those hair follicles, it's just, mm. yeah, you just, you can Because I would assume that's want. most people, right? The, the, you know, there's blood everywhere, or, you know, especially in a lot of cases, there's going to be some wet mud, et cetera. And people are dragging these things out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say like that's the the biggest the biggest issues we usually run into is drag marks, and cut through the armpits. Okay, um, you know people will cut in the wrong spot underneath the armpit instead of behind the leg in the right spot. Mm. That's probably the two biggest things. Um, that and not getting them taken care of quick enough. Yeah, you know like like you said, you know you got it in a cooler pretty quick and you're gonna freeze it. You know that's that's great, but you know what. Bacteria, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's something guys have to keep in mind that bacteria does not just add on to each other; it multiplies. So, once once a skin starts stinking, mm-hmm. like it's going downhill super super fast. Yeah, like you're, it's almost uncontrollable at that point. Mm-hmm. So guys will often wait till they smell something a little bit funny, and then oh, I got to get to this to the taxidermist. Too well, late. It's too late. Like yeah, mm-hmm. and that's it's, when it's you bad. start seeing that hair slippage occur exactly. and stuff. Yep. And another thing you got to be careful about is sometimes during the rut um, and when a deer's really run down, they'll actually go bad faster than if they're like early season right mm. now and healthy and vibrant, you know, they bacteria won't grow nearly as fast in them. But if they're really run down, sometimes it sometimes I mean, a couple of days is all you got. So because I know like a lot of guys from a, let's say from a meat standpoint, they want to let, let their deer hang. Right. Mm-hmm. They, they shoot deer, they put it up on the, the hanging pole, you know, like that deer, although we, we took care of, um, and they want to leave it hang for a few days. Not so good. Well, I mean, I'd say just skin the thing. Yeah. yeah. Skin it, I, then hang it. I personally, I mean, for the meat's sake, I, I skin my deer out almost instantly. Yep. I mean, rarely does a deer go over 30 minutes after I shot it before I have it skinned out. and Just to cool it. everything. Just, I, I like even to quarter it, you know, just yep. to get, get that. Get that uh, hot, just the, that hot meat cooled down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say just skin the thing skin out it. instantly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Which I mean, it's it's hard for guys if you know you're taking it to the butcher. You don't really know what they're going to be doing, and sometimes during gun season, there's backed up. Of yeah, them you're just out laying it the driveway, down. and probably most do? guys, right? Like most guys don't really put a knife in their deer other than to to gut it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. Yeah. You know, they just take it to the processor and then what the processor capes them out in a lot of cases. Yeah. Or either that or they bring it straight to the taxidermist. I would say that. over over fifty to seventy five percent of our deer come straight from the butcher. Mm. Yeah. Really? And that's, like that's they another, leave it with I the bet butcher. that's I bet yeah. that's dicey. Right. I'm sure there's <laughs> well, some butchers and I'm not saying just calling them all out, but I'm sure there's some butchers that are really good with knives and they take but I mean well, it, their like, priority is the meat. In yeah. gun season when you've got a hundred deer lined up, you know, you can't be sitting there for forty five minutes trying to keep this thing out yeah, clean. Yeah. For the most part, they do pretty good. I mean, because because we yell at them if they don't. Yeah, you know. Um, but <laughs> yeah. But anyways, uh, knife fight. <laughs> for the most part, yeah, butchers are butchers are most of the butchers are fine. Um, but yeah, the, another big thing too is like a lot of guys, butchers when they're busy, mm-hmm. they're gonna basically put it in a plastic bag, and then they're get water flying everywhere, so it's all wet in a plastic bag. And then if the that's guy like doesn't come pick it up right, yeah, if the that's guy doesn't like the come pick it up right away, happen. getting it wet, wet and heat, yeah, are the just the two worst things. Because that's bacteria. And yeah, that's just that's how bacteria multiplies, you know, and uh, you got to keep that the moisture and the heat off of them. 
Yeah. I think a big thing around the the skinning end is, and because I used to do it, and you know, not every buck or every deer that I killed was getting mounted, but you know, a lot of times I'd hang it up and I'd leave it go. If you skin that deer even two days later or something, it's a pain in the ass, right? It's it's super hard, especially in like the cold, you know, late. November oh, sure. fat builds up. You're trying. Whereas if you skin that deer in the first 30 minutes, I mean, it's pliable. I mean, you're, you're cleaning and skinning that thing out quick. It Pulls makes right it off. so much easier. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, you know, like if you think about the deer camp atmosphere, you know, deer's hung, you're cracking beers and like game over, like, you know, it's just yeah. gonna, it's just gonna <laughs> stay there for a while. Yeah. Um, but it, I think to your point, Trav, about trying to skin it out, especially if you're going to mount it and, and really releasing all that heat from the meat is, is super important. What do you think yeah. about is next day, like, okay. So like a lot of, a lot of guys shoot deer in, in November, right? Mm-hmm. So like, I don't know, late November, you know, early November, that's, that's probably your peak, like archery season. So if got a guy shoots a deer, you know, at night, you know, and he recovers it that night, you bring it in, you hang it up, you're drinking beers with your body, you're putting tape on it and stuff. Is it okay to let that deer go till the Till the next day. So if the plan is, okay, everybody else is going hunting again next day. I'm, plans usually, probably most common is to skin it the next morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is when that, I'm in camp and everybody else. That's is what hunting. I did with that uh, that yeah. clean 170 I brought. That's exactly what happened. We shot him at night, recovered him that night. I skinned him the next day and had it to you by noon. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very acceptable. That's that's 100% good. I, but where I'm, where I'm talking about is you know, letting it go a week. And that happens a, quite a bit, to wow. be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I know. A week or more. Dude, guys are like, yeah. like oh, fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think what I see a lot <clears throat> for guys is, and I've done it personally, is I'll, I like to release the heat from the meat. So I'll, I'll skin it out. We're going to coin that. I like really, to release the heat release from the, the meat. Heat from the meat. <laughs> that could be a t-shirt. Yeah. Nick, look, <laughs> Nick, put that down for our t-shirt ideas. Uh, <laughs> that'd be a good one. Um, and, but, when I get to the head, per like what Jared was saying, I'll cut it off and then I'll put the cape and the head over here and then essentially deer's skin. But, you know, now you've got that cape still over the face, over the ears, over everything. So, because that's the most time consuming part for most of us. Yeah. yeah. Um, the hardest part, too. Most yeah. And so of, yeah. that's where I think people probably get hung up with, like, oh, you know, I skinned it out and stuff. Well, that, those let that sit there for, they, sometimes until they take it to you guys, mm-hmm. like that's how they'll bring it to you guys and say, "Hey, yep, I caped it out." Well, really, the whole, you know, skull and everything's still in there, and the heat releases out of that pretty quick. The okay, head. Um, if you get it down to the base of the neck and you cut it off, um, you've eliminated a lot of the heat right there. Okay, you know, and and the thing is too, the faster you do that, the more the more time that will buy you in the end. You know, if you kill an animal and within fifteen minutes you've got that thing skin. And the head off, it will last a long time versus mm. the guy that lets it go three days or can't recover. Then he skins it, right? Has yeah, to or, recover it the next day. Yeah. Got shot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Time yeah. is of the essence. Then you got to get it exactly. Off. Yeah. Mm. If if I let a buck overnight and it's laying there the next morning, that thing's getting skinned and it's going straight to the taxidermist right away. And that's what gets a lot of guys too. I think. Yeah. You know, letting them overnight and then yeah, because then they fall in their normal process of okay, well, I recovered it now. We're gonna hang out. We're gonna enjoy camp. And but really, it's already been a day. Well, mm-hmm. dude, this deer right behind you, I was like pretty ner- nerve wracking because like not not only was this deer going overnight, but he's full velvet, mm-hmm. and I'm just petrified over like you know I know almost right away that velvet's gonna start to rot. Yeah. Um. So, I I don't think I could have planned that any any better but fortunately unfortunately it's like i never want the deer to suffer but like i had to put another arrow in that deer the next morning Mm -hmm. so there was obviously no decay happening over while the animal's still alive um so i was able to get another arrow in that thing and then immediately you know skin him out and i had him to to jeff within i don't know two hours of when the thing was dead yeah yeah that worked out (laughs) (laughs) but the velvet you got to be concerned about too yeah which is a you know a small number of of hunters sure. having to deal with on that side. Yeah. Um, and I assume that that's probably a big thing that if people do kill one in velvet, it gets screwed up pretty quickly. Yeah, it can. And, and you know, for the most part, it's it's where guys are holding it. Yeah, because it starts heat, to slip. All that heat too. taking picks yeah. and stuff like that, that's usually the first place it slips, right around the base is where mm. guys have their hands all the time. Because yeah. they, they call it, what what is the velvet repair call? Is it flocking? Is that what it's yeah. called? Yeah. Flocking? That's, yeah. They actually static, strip it and do that, right? Flocking. That's yeah. a completely manufactured velvet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's just little, little fibers that you buy and you put electric to the to the antlers, and shake it on there, and it just stands up. Oh wow! Yeah. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, I've actually crazy. got a little machine fooling around with it, but yeah, it's you, it's kind of a neat huh. process. Yeah, do you do much of that? I've seen some Not before, really, and I never yeah. thought they looked as good. Like as no, a, I you can never get it like it like it actually yeah, is. like yeah, it actually yeah. is. I mean, yeah. if you look at that, that's a pretty imperfect. Like it just you know. You can tell it's not been flocked. It's just like a. Yeah. Just hair. I mean, how are you going to replicate that with all the little veining and you everything? You can't. How? Yeah. How could you? Yeah. Yeah, and that obviously was a unique deer in that mm-hmm. he he never really shed. He yeah, just kept for growing. sure. So maybe his velvet's a little different than yeah. everybody else's, but. Huh. Well, ho- hopefully, I did okay on so that North Dakota deer that I shot had just the remnants, like two two percent of his, but it was enough that I was like, oh, it's pretty cool. You know, yeah. You can see yeah. it in the picture, and so. Um, I told you before, I just, I stripped it off right there. Cause I knew if we grabbed a hold of that thing, we had a ways to drag up. So we were going to, yeah. we were going to screw it up. So I just peeled the last little bit of it off. I mean, just, just to, just the pieces that were holding it on. It was already, it was loose and that all came off in one piece and I've got it in a Ziploc bag and it, it sat. So we got home, you know, it was late that night. It sat, uh, Oh, where was it? It was just in my bag. It was just in my bag, my pack, you know, in a room temp, you know, for overnight. And then I flew home with it the next day. And then I got it in a freezer last night, which in hindsight, I didn't really think. I didn't think about it as being like fleshy still because it's it was pretty dried up on for the most part. But I'll show I'll show it to you after. And like I probably rehydrated a little bit. It doesn't smell or anything. And yeah, well, actually, as soon as I put it in the freezer, I pulled it out 15 minutes later to like take a picture of it. And it was, it was like, I couldn't even see in the bag because it was whatever. Yeah. If it rehydrates, (laughs) you know, it could get to stinking a little bit, but if it was dried out, um, it was probably fine. Hmm. Um, is is that how you would recommend doing that? So I'm going to basically just give you the Ziploc bag and like, hope you know, it's a small enough amount that's not the end of the world if, if it if it doesn't work no, out. No, it'll be fine. But I'm going to have yeah. you, like, you're going to freeze dry it. You're going to put it in a freeze yeah, dryer. Yeah, I just, I got a little freeze dryer that I use for what's my like food a, going on. What's that, like west. an air fryer? Like a <laughs> taxidermist <laughs> no, version it's actually of like, fryer. it's like a vacuum chamber type deal. And uh, it freezes it down to like 20 below. And then it sucks all the air out. And uh, then it goes through a little bit of a drying process. But yeah. It's it's a cool is that it machine. is that all that is a freeze yeah, dryer Does yeah it's it that's how it works basically. twenty below zero is like it's cold but it's not that cold yeah I would have yeah. thought freeze dryer is like liquid nitrogen you're dipping it in or something it dries it as it cools or as as it warms up um, oh that's kind of I don't know the whole process that much but yeah hmm. I've fooled around with it. I I have my freeze dryer for food but um I've I've thrown in like some turkey feet and stuff like that yeah. was this one freeze dried or I know no. Je- Jeff injected that with formaldehyde didn't he no that one is pickled. Yeah. It's pickled. He actually brought it out to my place and we put it in my uh, tan. It's tan, basically. Mm. Yeah. And I found that works out really good on velvet. Um, just putting it right in the tan and, and tanning it. Yeah. Interesting. So, what do you mean? Like, you paint the outside of it with a tanning solution? No, or? I soak it. I stick it right in, right in the pickle. Like, you, know, you, have, you have to make a pretty good size. Is it pickle a viscous? Book. Like, is it thick or is it just like literally no, a liquid? No, it's water. just a liquid. Yep. Yep. Stick huh, it real, in the pickle. And real make... low pH and you just stick it in there. It has salt and acid and and different stuff like that yeah Yeah. how long you leave it in her uh usually uh three days is usually good for that yeah and even uh even a day or two pull it out and let it dry yeah wow do you rent do you wash it off yeah wash it off and then uh brush it every couple days as it's drying Mm. yep interesting it's pretty cool you can see there's like there's some ticks in that thing Okay. In the, in the hor- on the velvet and stuff, yeah. I'm like that's pretty wild. It's like as <laughs> as is, you know, just to see the dead ticks in there. That's not a surprise these days. Having yeah, the tick, those things are everywhere. Nasty, man. You know what, dude? I didn't come across a single tick in North Dakota. Uh, uh, not a one. We were walking through it too. I told you when we were in Kentucky, we hit a patch of seed ticks, Ugh. which caused me to like go down to like you know because I didn't even know like I was like what the hell are seed ticks because we ha- we get them in Kansas. And you I know they're baby ticks, right? They are. They're like the t- they're the tick larva, basically. Yeah. You know, and then they go through multiple stages until they get to adult size. But I mean, I w- I literally pick like 150 of them off the boys. That many. Yeah. I mean, oh. cover. I look. It, it, not not all in them, like just crawling. No, like 150 in them. Yeah, that was after we got like. So Holy we God, we dude. were going through this trail, <laughs> and Harlan said something like his leg was itching. I was like, whatever. And and then I looked and I was like, oh, it's just mud. Like we'll rinse it off. No, they were ticks. It looked like mud. It was that thick on his legs. No way. Yeah. Ugh. Nuts. And then so when we get back to the car, it's like literally I had a headlamp on and tweezers, and I like sat there for like two hours. Hmm. Yeah. Nasty. Yeah, they're bad. They're just getting bad. And I, I mean, we talk about it, 
before like i don't remember even like seeing a tick growing up in the woods mm -hmm. like i would find one and it was like holy shit like it's a deer tick. like they just mm -hmm. now it's like every trip it's like a lot mm -hmm. yeah i've right. been hit or miss for me i guess i haven't had one in quite some time it seems like i used to get them a lot maybe because you have lyme disease they don't find you attractive anymore <laughs> it's possible i dude i'll tell you what those mosquitoes like i'm it for them yeah like the, oh dude it was weird like me and lucas would be out there together and like he's wearing a t-shirt like a t-shirt like a, th yeah. a military thin t-shirt type deal and there's a couple of mosquitoes but and then you look at me i'm literally yeah. it looked like a fear factor thing like i'm getting just like swarmed it's that ice cream blood you got in you i got something going <laughs> dude and and i would go back and i would like take my shirt off and and like everybody in camp was like oh dude like, <laughs> like my shoulders just pouted my it's mainly my shoulders like yeah. where my pack wasn't and just stuff. pouted oh dude yeah. yeah yeah terrible i think like and they go down pretty quick but Interesting. when i when i shot that buck i finally like you know got rid of my ego enough to wear one of those mosquito jackets yeah and oh, thank god because change the game dude that well that last spot that i want was just i mean just they were ferocious even in the wind you know and so the only thing that was left was my face and so it's like you wish you had a third hand to just be constantly like doing this just like <laughs> I mean, I was just, it was yeah. crazy. Those mosquitoes are not. I mean, those here. those mud flats are where you see all that EHD pop up too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and and uh, I don't know how prevalent it is, but uh, they actually so we dropped my skull off at a CWD check station. Oh, really? Yeah. So they they tax number skull capped it. We kept the, mm -hmm. but then you take the head. I think with the brain in it. I don't. Mm -hmm. Lucas did it afterwards, yeah, yeah. but and then they there, just need the brain stem at the end. Yeah. And then there was a phone number for me to text and say, "Hey, I dropped it off," so they they know to go. They get know it. it's there. Yeah. Interesting. So we'll we'll get to find out if that thing had many. Because is that in a CWD zone? I don't know. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I know they have it. I think in North Dakota. I just don't know where. <laughs> I'll tell you what, dude. Um, not to sidetrack too far from our tax taxidermy conversation, but there's something going on out there, um, in terms of like the deer numbers, mm -hmm. and and I don't know. Like, I don't have enough personal experience with it, but just talking with Lucas and his dad, um, who's you know been out there their their whole lives. Uh, the deer numbers are significantly down. Really? And it's not like, you know, the, the year that they had EHD, which I think was two years ago, um, you know, you hear guys describe, like, the, he could drive down the river and just smell death, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he spends enough time in those woods that, you you know, when deer die, you, you find them, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's yeah. pi bone piles, there's remnants of them, there's deadheads and stuff. So that happened, but it seem, it, 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 it's seeming like it's just even despite that, it's like they're just not, either they're not rebounding or they're not, I don't know. Like, you know, there's some cons conspiracy stuff you could bring up or, you know, there's definitely like chemicals that are getting up. Like they, oh, from they, all the ag? they spray not just the ag, but a lot of those like residential areas and the surrounding fields, they hit them hard with like a mosquito repellent, like mm. chemical and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a permethrin spray. So, so, you know, we're obviously talking about it. Just, you know, it came up and we're talking about, you know, is it, is it affecting like con contraceptive or like is it yeah, birth so like, rates? Yeah. And, but we saw, I saw some fawns and stuff, but you know, the way he'd describe it is like, dude, these fields, you know, you'd see them this, as far as you can see these giant ag fields. He's like, you used to not be able to drive down these roads like at night. Like it was, you were, you would hit it. You, you're going to hit a deer. We didn't see a deer in those fields the entire week, not one deer, you know? And, and we had several sits. I had the four sits before I shot that buck. I didn't see a deer. Hmm. I see a deer and I don't, uh, those guys, you know, they can't, but we can't put a finger on it, you know, but just to hear, uh, Lucas's dad talk about, it, he's like, you know, even the deer on the wall, he's like, oh, frick, I used to, I used to be able to go out every day and see one of those things, you know, like, and now it's like a super rarity. And I know there's, you know, maybe, you know, it, 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 you talk about like back in the day, it's, it's easy mm -hmm. to exaggerate, but he's like, I literally used to be able to, I'd go out and crack them horns and Free, five bucks would come and running from every direction and then they'd leave and then they'd come back and he's like it's just it was like it was just really different really hmm. different because i mean if you think like in the southwest part of the state where we mule deer hunt like yeah. that I, one year we could watch you know a hundred whitetails funnel out into that alfalfa field and i don't know 20 bucks and then the next year we didn't see a deer <laughs> Yeah, and there was a, a drastic change with the drought that mm -hmm. year which i i think probably had the most to do with that but I haven't noticed what they're talking about anywhere else necessarily, um, mm -hmm. but where where they're at specifically, it, he's just seeming like a, a trend from ten years ago to today. Um, taking into account, you know, the EHD and stuff that's happened, it still though it seems like a, Are there a predators drastic, in that area? drastic decline. 
Yeah, there, there's mountain lions and stuff, but there always has been. Yeah, a lot. You know, there's lots of coyotes, and mm-hmm. yeah, dude, they're they're flighty. You know, just you sure. can tell they're getting hunted by n- yeah. not people necessarily. Yeah. They're just hunted all the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. like they got to survive. Weird. Yeah, I mean, that'd be something to figure out. I mean, because y- you do hear that more and more in different places. You know, I, I don't know if I've necessarily experienced it. I mean, the, the EHD thing's been the biggest one. And maybe it is as simple as that. You know, maybe it's just, yeah, they never have recovered from the EHD. Yeah, I mean, just two years ago, it's going to take three or four years to bounce back. Yeah. And maybe it won't ever be to where it was um, necessarily. Depends on how big of an impact it was and, you know, what the hunting regulations are. But, yeah, that's... That's concerning, though, Mm -hmm. for sure. Hmm. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, ten, you know, whatever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually a mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. They can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either muddy or stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. So, but anyways, uh, we... <laughs> What were we talking? We we're talking about velvet and yep. uh, taking care of that. So I guess to wrap my stuff up, so he's gonna deep freeze and send you that hide, and it sounds like we're in good shape with that. The velvet, we got it, you know, freezing. You're gonna uh, take care of that and, and sprinkle it back on. And the last thing I guess is the um, the antlers. I, I actually considered. I was like, man, if I can get a skull cap tonight, I was like, I could check it and fly back with it. But we, it, I don't know. We didn't necessarily have. I didn't have the time, and mm-hmm. I didn't have like all the materials, like. And so to he's, box it, to box it and stuff. So he's going to just ship it back to me directly. So this, cause you don't need that right until, nope. um, until you're ready to, the, the hide's been tanned and everything. Best like to have a so. tracking number on that bad boy. I, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So he's gonna, he's going to tape all the points, you know, bubble wrap it and everything and put it in like a, you know, a solid box and ship it, ship mm-hmm. it overnight as well. So hopefully I'll have that back here within a week. He said he just, we transferred me some, uh, some videos stuff so we can watch it. Yeah. Before the, I have the recovery video and stuff and, oh dude. What, what a memory. Like we, we, cause I didn't know, dude, what deer I shot. I, I knew it was, yeah. I, I was like, it, it's, it's a shooter for sure. You know, but I didn't, I had no idea. I really didn't. So when we went down and recovered that thing, it was me, Lucas and his dad. And I had prefaced him. I'm like, hey, it's, you know, it's at least a three. I was like, I made, I think I made a good shot. I'm more confident in the shot than what deer I hit, you know? Yeah. And so when we went down and Lucas, Lucas told me, he's like, I, I knew what deer he shot. He's like, I just, I had a gut feeling. Just knew which one. Yeah. And when we recover him, he's like, it's freaking him. And we, you know, we, he's like, it's a giant. And, we, and, <laughs> and dude, we just lost his, like, and his dad, do you got to like meet his dad at some point? He's just a, a, a hoot. Yeah. You know, and. Oh, we, yeah, we had, we had quite a memory down there, but, but that's it. So, I mean, I'll, I'll have you all that stuff. And then whenever you need the skull cap and so hopefully yeah, I'm, getting to you so, did well. I'm yeah. so early in the year here, you know, I'll have that back, you know, you knock them out pretty quick. I, I won't hold you to a time frame or whatever, but, <laughs> but what are you thinking? Honestly? <laughs> yeah. But so what do you think a couple of weeks or, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I'm going, I'm going pl- pedestal on this one. Yeah. I do. I just had yeah. a, you know, they're more expensive, right. And it's, you know, they take up more space and stuff, but like, just the experience that we had there and the quality of deer mm-hmm. that it is for that area and stuff. There was just, I was like, this thing's getting a pedestal. Yeah. Yep. yep. I love pedestals. Yeah. yeah. They're my favorite for sure. Can you do them? So like, is, is everyone, is there uh like, do they all get mounted kind of the same or cause I had, en- I had envisioned essentially putting it on like a, you know, a black piece of steel, like the square, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just, I'm, I'm going to put it straight on to the top of like an old, uh, it's actually a wine barrel, but it looks mm-hmm. like a whiskey barrel. And so I'm just going to, yep. can we do that? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You can, you can do them all different ways. 
Um, I do a lot of them where I use a like a pipe system where they can spin them around mm. after they're on there. Uh, guys like that, and you can take you can take them off on and off. Yeah. And then sometimes too, if I have a piece of driftwood going up, I'll pin them right to the side where you can just pop them off the mm-hmm. side of it. That works really good. But yeah, there's all different kinds of ways you can attach them, and yeah, makes no difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that one has just a metal post that goes into that you know landscape basically, so I can pull it off and and move yeah. it if I want. Mm-hmm. Well, we had some cool ideas for mounts while we were out there. Maybe you've seen some stuff like this, but there's so much water out there, uh-huh. and you can hear them. Like, they got to cross these channels. So these oh, bucks yeah. are swimming, like, on a daily basis. And it'd be cool if, if you happen to encounter one doing that or and then kill him or something to, to get him, like, almost on a glass table or something where his head's... Oh, that'd be really cool. You know what I mean? Where he's yeah. where he's actively swimming and stuff, head, head up above water. That'd be really cool. I've seen those with, like, gator mounts and stuff. Yeah. So, something like that. That'd, that'd be, be pretty sick. Pretty wild. Yeah. That'd be really cool. Yeah. This was, when I killed this buck, it was the only hunt that we didn't get in a boat beforehand. We, we put in, like, 40 miles on the... Because on, this one had a land bridge over to the mm-hmm, peninsula. Yeah, and we had access through some private stuff to get to it. So it was it, it was public land where I shot him. But we accessed through a small piece of private, and uh, yeah, it was the only hunt we didn't get in the water of some sort. Other times we were canoeing down channels, and mm-hmm. a lot of river bottoms, probably all river bottoms. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. A lot of we saw a lot of moose. You know, pushed a bull moose out of that last spot and stuff, and that's nuts. Yeah, wild country. To oh, think it about is. it, it is for sure. Hmm. But you're getting ready to head out west here pretty soon, right? Yeah, yeah. Here a uh, couple weeks, hopefully. Yeah, been training <laughs> sometime before the end of September. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, I just came back from Alaska, so I kind of got my mountain legs on me a little bit. So. You did. That's yeah. right. Did yeah. you? What were you guys hunting out there? So I had a buddy that he wanted to do a sheep hunt. Um, and did you kill a sheep out there? No, I didn't. No, you told, I wasn't. You told me about that. Oh, he 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 did. He killed a sheep. Just yeah. brought you with him, type of yeah. Deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just there to pack his stuff and everything. So yeah, and he killed got one? to experience the the whole deal, and that was yeah. It was just is that a phenomenal. doll sheep or yeah yeah. yeah. Yep, and I got to shoot a caribou and a wolf when I was there. You did, and yeah, and then he got a grizzly too. So whoa, yep, yep. we had wow. an action-packed adventure. Holy <laughs> cow, man, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. If you like adventure hunts, like Alaska is, it's, <laughs> it's get much more adventurous than yeah. that. Yeah, it's top notch. How big was the wolf? Uh, I don't even. I mean, when I was holding him up, like grabbing him by the by the chest, I think it was his feet were coming close to the round. I mean, wow. I don't know what poundage wise, even what it was. It was probably an average size. Is that the first yeah. one you've shot? Yeah, yeah, I've never shot a. Wolf. Did it see? Like, was it one of those experiences you walked up and you're like, like this thing's big, dude? The feet, the feet are the like the craziest. Like their paws are just huge. Like that's that's what caught me. You know? Yeah, and their head obviously, yeah. and and everything. Yeah, because you but, think like, oh, it's just like a big dog, but when you walk up on it, it's like. Whoa. And it was kind of a scrawny looking thing. Yeah. But, but it was still big and long and lanky or whatever. But yeah, it was it was a cool, cool Damn. deal. Speaking of Africa, not to backtrack at all, I just got a pile of pictures of one of the guys that hunts with us in Ohio. He's uh-huh. I guess he's in Africa. Is that Willie? They shot a pile of stuff. Yeah, him and Glenn. I assume do, do they do most of that stuff over there? Like guys that are in Africa, they just leave it with a tax thermos and then they a ship few, it all back? A few guys do, but a lot of them, I would say most of them bring it, bring it back. They do. Yeah. They do. Yep. And there's some kind of like weird import. Yeah, it takes a while. It mm-hmm. takes a good while. Mm-hmm. And then it's gotta it's gotta go to like a tannery. Um, I don't even know it. I wanna say FDA, but that ain't the right letters to it. But mm-hmm. anyways, it's gotta go to a to a tannery. Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as it comes over. Yeah. Gotcha. You know? so, mm. anyways, though, what you, we were on. Wait, so when did you leave for that? Uh uh, Alaska that was uh, August sixth or something like that. No yeah. way. Yeah. So I, we That's just got super back super early. Yeah. Yeah. I, we were up there, and I thought I was going to have to cancel the pod because <laughs> we weren't sure. Like we literally shot our sheep the last day that we could before we were going to have to reschedule our flights. Oh wow. To the end of the season. Holy because the yeah. Would you told have done us, that? You'd have just yeah, extended I'd the have flight. Just, we'd have just extended everything. Oh yeah, yeah dude. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the outfitter said you guys are getting a sheep no matter what, as long as you're willing to stay. So. Yeah. We were in for the long haul. That's wow. what you got to do for these things, man. That North yeah. Dakota trip, I don't know if I told you, I pushed my flights two days. Really? Which I did, was I did, smart. Yeah. I didn't stay longer, but I went, I, you know, I just pushed the trip back two days because yeah. of the weather. Mm-hmm. That's probably what gets most people. You just don't budget enough time. Like, it just takes time on those yep. hunts. Mm-hmm. You know, you got down days, weather days, and everything like that. You got to you gotta figure enough time to be successful. How long were you but guys yeah. up there for? Um, I want to say we hunted for 19 days. <laughs> yeah. And this was the first legal sheep that we found. 
Holy it was cow. just really. It's one of those hunts where it can be really easy or it can be really grueling and long Jeez. and just go forever. But um, it, it's it's one of those hunts where like you work so hard at it that when you finally accomplish it, it's just like it's, yeah, it's almost a high over level top of emo- emotions. Yeah. So the yeah. doll the doll sheep. Forgive me for my negligence here. It's those are white. Yeah, they're white. little black antler horns like us. No, no, they they've got the curls. Curls. And oh yeah. They've got to be full curl to be legal. Okay. So okay. that puts them at usually mm-hmm. around eight years old. Mm. Um, so they base you're basically taking I I don't know what percent, but it's a very low percentage. Oh wow, of the herd. that's a wild looking deal. So yeah. that's different than like a big horn. A big horn is they're more grayish brown mm-hmm. is the one I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's a cool yeah. looking animal. The cool thing is where they live, like just way up in the rocks, and yeah, yeah that's that's the best part about it. And so he yeah. also killed a grizzly. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, all all rifle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Actually, Chris B was in camp there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he, he shot I never, caribou. Yeah, I never got to see him. We knew he was going. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, uh, I just I seen his name up there, and I was like, huh, what the world? I guess I missed him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he never got to see him. No, no. Uh, so he, how's that work? You you fly into a lodge, and then you go out in the field from there, and you're just out there. You know, mm-hmm. like he could have been a hundred miles from us. You know it. Wow. Yeah. But so they, they basically, that's the central base camp, and exactly. then everybody's spiking out from there. Yeah. How okay. many, like, guys would you say are in the base camp, or how many names are on the board or whatever? Oh, I, this this was, like, over the last three years, all the names that were up there, but he had Chris mm. B. 2023 or something like that written there. So I was like, oh, he was here this year. Wicked. Yeah, because yeah, he was up there caribou about. hunting. He killed a caribou, actually. Yeah, we knew he was coming. He just came guy. on a couple weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, that's why he told us at that. And he's like, yeah, Alaska's yeah. first trip. Because I saw he was out. He's heading to elk camp for three weeks now. Mm-hmm. So, small yeah, world, I, though. I don't know. You're running my cousin out there, did you? You know Ethan guides in Alaska? That's your cousin? Sheep hunts. Ethan Johnson? No way. Were yeah. you with him? Absolutely. Yeah, I flew with him. Yeah, yeah that's, my, that's, <laughs> that's insane. That's my first cousin. <laughs> I see. He was at the farm a couple weeks ago. I see. Yeah, they're from Broken Bow, Nebraska. Okay. Yeah, but so he guides yeah. sheep and so what's that what's that outfitter's name? Uh Riley Pitts. What's the company called though? Uh Big Game Backcountry Guides. Yeah. I yeah, I don't know if I could have sure. told you that yeah. necessarily, but yeah, he's yeah. been guiding with them for a, a long time. That's yeah, funny. super cool guy. Like, How, like what him. a small world, dude. Yeah. <laughs> we escaped to Alaska to get away. Oh, we know everybody. Crispy, <laughs> your cousin. <laughs> How funny. Uh, so did he actually guide you or just you flew together? No, he's just a pilot now. He used oh. to guide, but yeah, he, he actually flew. He, I know he's a big pilot, dude. They fly all over, like their, their farm in uh, Nebraska. He tells me all the time about like, uh, you hear crazy stories about them flying planes down and dropping their wheels on their buddies' trucks and stuff. And they're shooting yeah. coyotes out of them all the time. Like those guys just fly planes. Like it's, you know. I mean, if he's like, a bush pilot, he's yeah. probably going to have some stones on him. <laughs> So, There's no doubt about it. Yeah, because, I mean, they're flying in some gnarly stuff up there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this one place we were landing, we flew around, and we made another pass, and I was like, what are we doing, you know? He's like, oh, just, you know, check and see where all the logs and the stones and stuff are so you can dodge them, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that's just, so just funny. Dude. Looking said, at that's everything. Cousin? Yeah. He used to uh, he used to film for Sub 7, and uh, which was like Lee and Tiffany. So he used to film for Lee and Tiffany way early on. and. Okay. Uh, and Foxworthy as well. And then I don't know if that sub seven's still around, but he got into more, you know, farming and, mm-hmm. and more in, into the guiding and stuff too. And then I think more recently here has gotten his pilot's license and pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's neat. Wow. Yeah. yeah, small world, man. I'm a scary small. <laughs> I know, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, just because, I mean, you, you think of like Alaska and how freaking big it is. And then look, there's well, two people you, you know, cross paths with. How right many there. guides, you know, are, I think are, you know, good operations are up there? Is there quite a few or? There's a decent amount. But man, I, I'm just hearing more and more like just the horror stories, you know, of yeah. Yeah. Guys well, and not I mean, getting treated well. And I was going to say that. not getting treated well. That's, that's not the place you want to be with a piss poor service <laughs> yeah for <You> know? sure. <laughs> speaking yeah. of grizzlies and everything like you want to make sure that you're with the right people up there or even flying in some of these back areas with a, a bush pilot like that guy better know what he's doing yeah yeah so what was the trip like you flew from have a layer somewhere and then to washington and then a third flight up into alaska yeah and then a fourth to, flight probably flew to seattle then to uh anchorage you did a direct anchorage. flight to seattle yeah uh, that yeah. works out and then to purdue bay um, so that's basically right up along the northern edge of, of Alaska there. Mm-hmm. And then they actually drove, they flew their bush planes into the airport there and picked us up and flew us out to the lodge. Yeah. And uh, then from there, they fly you out to the field. Wow. Yeah. 
Like every it's, day type of thing? Every no, day you no, fly out on No, you're out in the field. You for stay in the field. 10, 12 days, however long it takes. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yep. And you set up your own spike camp out there? Yep. Yep. Fly out there, set up your tents, and then usually you have kind of a base camp by the strip. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of backpack hunt from there. You go out for three, four days, one direction, then go out another direction. That's kind of how they typically do. So, so was it yeah. you, the, the guy that you were hunting with, and one guide, or how many people did you yeah. have? Yep. Camp? There were three of us. Just total. three of you. Yep. Me and my buddy and uh, a guide. Yep. Hmm. Yep. A lot of glassing. A lot. Of, so, did you it's guys start, start, start with sheep, or was it just opportunistic? If you bounced some of it, yeah, we were obviously our sheep was our number one. So we kind of sheep hunted, and then if something else got in our way, we shot that. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a good style. Yeah, yep. I know Ethan guided my uncle, his dad, uh, a couple of years, I, I guess, out in that same region for, and he shot a uh, a giant grizzly with his pistol. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's quite a few grizzlies around. We saw a decent amount of them. You did. And the crazy thing is, like, so you set up your camp down by the rivers and stuff, and that's literally where the grizzlies yeah, are. Yeah, all the I mean, same. Grizzly tracks just walking yeah. right by your, you know, going by your tents and stuff. It's, <laughs> it's pretty insane. But yeah, you don't you don't walk anywhere without a gun. And mm-hmm. yeah, definitely definitely keep your head on a swivel. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what it seems like for most people that are up there. It's like. You know, but the, depending on where you're at in the bear population, it's like, you know, you're you're just as much looking for whatever you're hunting as you are keeping an eye out on your own ass, mm. basically. Um, so, yeah, yep. it gets, yep. gets dicey in some of those spots. Uh, in fact, I don't know. Uh, I think it was up there when um, a few years ago when Levi Morgan was hunting and, and they were, like, going down through a bunch of brush and stuff and they got charged by a grizzly like they were basically in the brush and like next you know it's like n- damn near on top of you and i think yeah. god fired a few shots at it and but it, it was you know your butthole puckered basically <laughs> sure you know? yeah i mean if you have a couple of different guys you know that it goes your your that danger goes down significantly because Obviously, you can cover for each other. Yeah, you got more eyeballs. All get in a group and yell at them or whatever, and sometimes they'll turn and run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah, it's definitely got to keep it in mind. Hmm. But, yeah. Wow, yeah, man, that sounds like a wild trip. It's a real it's real glassing intensive, Like, and I, I love that style of hunting, um, just getting high and glassing. Yeah. So I was, like, in heaven. So what you take? Just, you take a spotting scope then for that? or is it Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. showed you those binos that I have, right? I don't know if – those image, stable, image stabilized, stabilized deals. You have those, yeah. I'd I'd love to. Yeah, They're I've never home. seen. Do you yours. have yours here? Mm, they may be in the truck. Oh, dude. Yeah, if you're doing any yeah. glassing at all, like uh, we'll see if they're in my truck. I've heard a lot right about now. them. I don't like up there I'm, in, in an area like that. I don't know if they do you much good, but in like a thick area where you're glassing, you know. Yeah, I mean, like when we were in the Dakotas for muleys, like just instead of having to set up a tripod and that, you just. You know, and you're you're seeing a mile and a half pretty easily to know like if I'm gonna go over there or if I'm glassing one off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So now so you guys kill all that stuff. Obviously it's not like, oh, let's get this thing in the freezer. Like what do you do with capes and stuff? Because, I mean that that would assume be my concern as a taxidermist is how am I gonna properly take care of these things while I'm out here for yeah. two weeks. Well the biggest thing was I mean Basically, I skinned everything and fleshed it right on the spot. You did? Yeah. Okay. So that, that significantly... And fleshed re- it right on the spot. Yeah, turned the lips, nose, ears, you know, all of that stuff, got all the flesh off of it. Mm. Um, once you do that, I mean, you're pretty safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were very good about getting your stuff out of the field. Like, you'd text them, like, you have inReaches or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. satellite messenger. Yeah. Uh, message the outfitter and he'd fly out as soon as he could possibly could so you guys are yeah. still out but he lands he takes stuff and gets it back exactly so oh, you pack okay. it back to the strip yep he'd come flying in and, and pick it up and haul it back and they would start salting and everything right wow there. Mm-hmm. very yeah. cool i know yeah, they had a really good operation up there i was very impressed yeah i know that's yeah. a big concern for like when i shot that elk last year uh when you're in there by horseback it's it's like it's at least a day before yeah. that stuff is getting back and like we, we you know we did our best to recover them right away and get them quartered, get the meat separated and stuff. But still, um, I mean, it's, you know, not, didn't, didn't I you worry, have, you know, it's sitting there, it's 60, 67 degrees during the day. It's sitting in the shade, but you're like, man, I hope it's, yeah. hope it's gonna be okay. Didn't yeah. you have a, an elk or your dad had one that yeah. went bad? Yeah. Well, I, that just speaks to like, you know, going with guys and maybe you, you learn it with experience, hard lessons like that, unfortunately. But I, yeah, dad was out there. He's out there right now. But I know. Yeah. Um, they shot an elk, and it sounds like it was a questionable shot, so they didn't 
look for it till the next day, and it took them a while to find it. I think it was a gut shot, so it was already. You know, and I don't know exactly if they got. If they, I'm assuming they gutted it, or uh, but they spent and it rained. It rained, you know, and it's just not. It didn't sound like a good situation at all. So, but then they spent the whole next day packing it out. You know, they quartered it there and they and they packed mm -hmm. it out on their backs and stuff, and then finally got it to the processor, and he's like, "No, it's not. It's rancid. Like smell it." Yeah. You hmm. know, and I, I don't yeah, know. and I would assume if the meat's going bad, your cape's probably in in rough shape at that point. It too. depends. It depends. Yeah, some of those elk capes are probably one of the most hardy capes. Are they? That there are. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> seems that way. Anyways, yeah. I don't recall if he was if it was like a good bull or if he was going to mount. It might have even been a cow. I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. So, but it was. The, I remember the meat was rancid, and that was like, yeah, you know what what a a blow. Like, yeah. Because it was a tough hunt already. I think they were having trouble finding elk and stuff, and when they finally did get one it was a bad shot and then when they finally did get the meat to the processor it was yeah. bad <laughs> it's a lot of work for us oh yeah. dude the whole thing yeah. sounded like not something you want to repeat you know because that's what i'm like trying to think positively for this upcoming week when we're in kentucky elk hunting it's like it's gonna be hot you know so if if he shoots one right even if we find it number one i mean we're in like old strip mine areas it's straight up straight down so you gotta quarter it cape it out get it out of there you know it's 85 degrees listen to this I, it's kind of a pretty random thought here but somehow you, you spike this so we've talked to mike you, have, you know mike yoder out of ohio he runs that i've, I've watched drone deer stuff. recovery yeah, stuff. That's about it, yeah. cool guy also has a pilot's license uh I, you've seen these drones that they're they're doing pest herbicides and stuff yep. with so uh, clearly they have unmanned yeah you, know, you know drones that you can fly a significant amount of weight on yeah how many times have you been in your tree stand and thought like, oh, I wish I had like a sky, some kind of sky elevator, some Charlie and a chocolate factory type thing to get me in here. Get me in. Dude, imagine if you could just strap, strap into a cable, not on the drone, but like have it way up above you <laughs> for stealth and, and, and you're hooked in, you know, let's think about these guys saddle hunting, right? Just hanging from your, yeah. or you're just drive, driving the remotes yes. on it. Drive you in, bring you, bring you right down, fly the thing away, park it. When you when you need to get in all the deer and field flying, I'm sure that falls under some category of like hunting with a drone. But I'm also sure they haven't written a yeah. thing for that yet. So. No, I'm sure they haven't. Those big ones. I mean, well, because I think most of those can only carry like up to ten gallons or so. And so, what's what's a gallon of water weigh? Pints a pound. I've seen, dude. I've, I've seen videos of drones like guys eight holding pounds, on to them. Eight back. pounds for a gallon of water, then probably. So you're talking about eighty pounds. Oh no for that way! To lift they can, I'm sure there's drones that carry way more than that. Yeah, I've, Our, I've seen videos of drones, guys holding on to them and picking them up. Those ones we saw at the Ag Progress right. days were giant. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You need yeah. a, you need a big, a one, beast, obviously. like pretty much a helicopter. Per yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Be a little noisy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's why I'm saying get it way up there. You know. Yeah. And you could just hang from you could hang from i was thinking about you know taking meat out that way yeah is what spurred that thought but taking uh dude i it, i'm you know we talk about the progression of electronics and and hunting and so it wouldn't surprise me at some point if there aren't bush pilots it's remote drones that come in and pick your stuff up at camp and take it right back out type yeah. of thing yeah well here's something interesting so we were driving over a big huge flat area out there and there's this big old payloader out there in the middle i was like how I was asked the pilot, I was like, how in the world did you guys get that thing or did they get that thing out mm -hmm. here? And he's like, oh, helicopter. <laughs> brought it out. So they brought it, it out down. piece by piece, you know, bring wow. a tire on the helicopter and on yeah. and on. Yeah. Well, dude, out west, another application of that, whether it's a helicopter or a, uh, you know, the, the drone thing I'm proposing here is like getting across some of these to those landlocked mm -hmm. publics. You know, pick oh, you yeah. Up and fly you across private. Yeah. Well, you think about like the military helicopters and stuff taking, you know, bulldozers and things oh, in yeah. all the time. I mean, they're they're lifting those things and dropping them down in the desert. You well, know, they have the technology. It's just not, you know, feasible for public. Yeah. yeah. Well, whether it is public or it's just not financially doable. Well, I mean, you look at what Mike did on the thermal drone thing. It's like, you know, two even two years ago, who would have said, I'll pay twenty five thousand dollars for a thermal drone and that's how we'll find deer. You know, it wasn't even on the top of any of our minds, which is why Mike's very successful at yeah. it. That's and now it's like well, damn, that's a great idea. It just took a, a business <laughs> mind to do to do the math and say, yeah. well, if I charge five hundred per, and yeah. if I have to do thirty of these to pay for my drone, it's kind of a no brainer. It's no different than the military. I mean, think about all the like unmanned drones that we use in the military now versus like manned planes and stuff. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just evolution of risk and and safety and stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, at some point, I'm sure, you know. Instead of a bush pilot flying out to pick up your stuff, it'll be a drone that comes in, sets down, you hook it up, and it'll back out.
Sure. I think I they're not allowed to have helicopters in that area, I know. Um probably, probably unless it's for rescue, search for and rescue, rescue or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Um so I don't know how a drone I'm sure drones are probably not allowed mm-hmm. either. Probably. But yeah. Yeah. I mean yeah. that's that's some nasty territory. I mean it's one of the I remember reading a stat one time. I think it was when I was going to school for like a biologist and it was like the number one death for like wildlife biologists was like playing in helicopter crashes. And a lot of them were in Alaska. Yeah. Cause you think about how nasty some of those, the weather conditions and, and turbulence and everything that you end up hitting through some of those passes is like, you know, yeah. yeah hard they, to they have to turn around sometimes and come back. Yeah, they did that a couple of times when we were there. Yeah. Just can't they'd go out it. to take somebody and they just had to come right back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got too rough. And again, you think about, now versus like in the 70s and 80s when people were doing that i mean technology's advanced so far and like we still have to do that kind of stuff mm-hmm. you know it's just uh, mother nature up there is is wicked for sure um so you're not done obviously it's you know september we're just getting going here you got another western hunt coming up yeah yeah i'm I'm planning to go to wyoming i have a couple elk tags out there so and you go to wyoming a couple almost every year right yeah, i have four elk tags i think yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not all for Wyoming, obviously. <laughs> Three for Wyoming. So a bull tag really? and two cow tags. Wow. In Wyoming. And then I have an Idaho tag, too, just in case I get done early, I guess. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Will you shoot that many? You, would you? I'll shoot? shoot as many as I can get. I love the meat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, yeah, I, I eat game meat. Like, that's all I eat. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I eat it all the time. I mean, I the sheep, he gave me half the sheep, and it's almost gone already. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I, wow. I, I'll knock out stuff like crazy. Dude, yeah. I, I got to tell you, I was, I, I'm just not, a, I'm not a huge gamey guy. And it's my fault because I don't, you know. I, if you take care of it, it is amazing. You like, would think well, with your lifestyle the and off. your diet, like it I would. I know, fit. I know. And there have been times where I fantasized about like, I'm going to really get into the. Because you ate all your elk meat from last year. I have it all. I have a lot of it still in yeah. the freezer. I just I don't eat it as often. You gave it to me, and I ate a bunch. I, dude, I'll give. If anybody wants elk meat, let me know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you. <laughs> I love giving it to people. Dude, you have as much as you want. Seriously, yeah. um, in North Dakota, his uh, his wife cooked a lot of venison for us, and also we ate the ribs, which I've never done yeah. off of my buck. Right then and there, like when we were caping it out, yeah. his dad dad cooked them, cut them off right on the fire, and we ate them right there. I can see why people don't eat them, but also it was really good. It was, yeah. You know, it's like different part of the experience. Yeah, It's not beef ribs, but dude, I had, she, um, canned some venison. Oh yeah. Oh my word. Yeah. I couldn't believe that Off it was venison. Charts. It was like so good. Yeah. Real tender. Just super tender. We had it mixed into, yep. uh, you know, whatever. So I made me rethink like, dude, I, and I knew this was the case. I'm just not. It takes time it and right. patience right. to do to do a lot of that stuff. But, but if I can, I'll, I'll give that recipe to like my mom because she does a lot of canning of her gardening stuff. I'll be yeah. like, here, do this with these deer. <laughs> it's it you know it it is a I don't know if it's necessarily an acquired taste. It kind of is in that like there are certain people I know that will eat like if I make um if I make venison sausage or something like that or I like I made a I made a ton of venison uh, hot Italian sausage mm-hmm. this year, which is awesome. Dude, we had venison bacon. Yeah. Freaking really good. Real. I had it on like an egg sandwich. Yeah, really <laughs> good. But like at the same time, like I, I love just like a really nice, like medium rare grilled tenderloin mm-hmm. type, you know, or backstrap or whatever. And there's a lot of people that just like, you know, hunters who just are like, nah, I don't like, like, I don't like that. And it's like, really? Like that's to me, like hard to be one of the best things. And I think it's just cause you know, it's, it's not as fatty and, and stuff as beef. So it's just. You know, Most it's just of the time, different. meat's not taken care of very well either. And sure, you know, if if you take care of it like they take care of your cow at the butcher shop, I mean, it's it makes a huge difference. That's I've heard I, caribou is one of the better you know meats in that. that it's it's real soft, like it's yeah. real soft and tender. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I ate one of my back straps and it's yeah, it's really good. Really huh. good. Is there yeah. anything to obviously it's it's hard to you know plan for this, but like so that that deer that shot at North Dakota was a perfect heart shot. Like when we pulled it out thing went right through the center of the heart and um luke's dad mentioned he's like did you notice how there was like when we were uh caping it out and stuff there was like no blood in anything and he was describing he's like that meat's gonna stick to your knife like like and and i don't know it's like is that good like do you want that you know or i I don't know yeah Hmm. just in terms of like you you hear about like if they 
if you shoot them a certain way or it takes them like if their adrenaline gets pumping you hear mm. about like what makes meat good well, yeah, or bad. stresses and things uh-huh. like that yeah. and that's why a lot of people hang their deers they you know gravity to remove a lot of the blood from the muscles and stuff yeah. like that and a lot of that stuff to me is just kind of like yeah you know hearsay or folklore i'm like i don't know what's what's right you know it's we try to do our best with it but yeah, I don't, I mean, certain things like on the fish side, a lot of times you'll bleed a fish because it's an oily fish, right? So you'll bleed it so that it, it kind of pumps up. But from a deer side, I don't know. I mean, people also age their deer, you know, and let it hang and want to age it for weeks at a time or yeah. whatever. And it's like, I don't know. Yeah, and it's just something you kind of do. It's like... Um, Meanwhile, we were cutting, we were taking tenderloins right out of our mule deer. Like we literally sure. were processing and cooking it. And I thought it was like off the charts. Sure. We were also starving, but yeah. sure. <laughs> it's always way better out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, like, like we actually have meat, you know? Yeah. Well, it just, you know, shines light on the fact that whether it's from the taxidermy standpoint on the hide and, and all that stuff or on the, on the meat side, I think there's a lot of, I think unknowns, unless you really are like a professional, you've done, you've done a lot of them. I, I would say that most people mishandle hide and meat then actually handle it correctly yeah just from a generalized standpoint and that's no knock on anyone but temperature there's a lot of things i mean think of getting a 65 degree day in november and it's like oh you know you know you just you're not in a rush and like you know as that progresses bacteria for the hide and for the meat everything adds up pretty quickly at the same time there aren't there guys that dry age their meat like they just like literally hang it outside for like six months uh, regardless usually of temperature in like a dark a dark cool place okay is what they do and then they cut the cut the right. top Brown. off yeah yeah and then have that meat in there there's mm-hmm. a lot of people that dry age that stuff i think the it, and again i'm not a butcher by any means i think in the meat side of things a lot of it is like the glands making sure that you know you're breaking apart and getting those glands out obviously not busting like the pee sack and getting pee all over the meat and things like that. Like there's just in timing from a warmth standpoint, um, especially early season, being able to get as much heat out of that body. I think that's the biggest thing. That's when I noticed the biggest change is when I just got them cooled down as fast as fast as possible. Yeah. 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 Cause I know a lot of people, um, well, in the early season, it used to be like they would skin it and they would they would have it like a you know like a slab of beef, base, have it and just open it up and you know just try to get as much cool air into that thing as possible. Quartering probably helps with that, just to get the yeah, meat separate, yeah, exactly. so it's all, it's just yeah. by itself and then get it in the shade. And stuff. I mean, you've mm-hmm. you've probably you know quartered a deer two hours after it's it's done and you you cut the quarter off and they're just steam pouring out. Yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah. If you do that fifteen minutes to half an hour, you just cut a bunch of time yep, off time. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And even like, so when I get an elk, you know, their, their back hands are just huge. <laughs> and, uh, so I'll actually slit by the bone and open, open I'll that, that all open and just let it cool there. Are you, just, are you, do you debone it completely or just go right by that? Like, I eventually, and open yeah, it? yeah. Debone everything. Yeah. Cause there's just, no point in hauling all that up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Just open it up. Yeah. That's, uh, I think it is a big thing from the handling side. It, it also is just, you know, how you prepare it, you know, in terms of cooking it like i'll eat venison tacos you know once a week that's where, that, that's where know, i'm lacking yeah i think like from a, a game management standpoint like i'm i'm doing it right yeah. you know but then when it comes to taking the next steps to to process it and it's time turn it into something, it's just the time and the yeah like poppers with like jalapeno cream cheese and bacon like i know it'll change your mind real quick like i am jealous of like when i eat really good venison i'm like i could do i can do this yeah you like, could do this and but do it, you it, like burgers huh. yeah Cause that's that's what I eat. Most venison of the time. burgers. Yeah, burgers. Yeah. 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 Mm. I basically I take every piece of fat off possible, um, off the deer, yep. and then I'll add like fifteen to twenty percent beef fat. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's, you do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you just, just grind it. So what do you just mix it in wh- wh- during the grinding process? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just weigh it out, and then I mix it through a rough grind, and I'll just throw chunks of fat in as I go, and then uh, run it through a fine grind and. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah, that beef fat kind of keeps the dryness mm-hmm. out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Could, that's a big one. Have you ever yep. done that bacon or had that? The bacon? I've had it. Venison bacon? I was yeah. like, couldn't believe it. It was yeah. like really good. Because, I mean, it's essentially ground meat, and then they smoke it, and then they cut it. Yeah, like it's just bacon. flattened out. Like yeah. Somebody, I don't yeah. know, rolled it or something. Yeah, I've, I've like doing um, breakfast sausages and hot sausages. Mm-hmm. And I'll instead of beef, I use pork fat. Mm-hmm. to cut on that side mm-hmm. um i think a lot of people from a venison side it, the fat content's a big one like if you just grind venison and you don't add anything mm-hmm. like it gets dried out really quick and and yeah, yeah it, it has a little bit of a gamey taste to it um 
but I think the fat content is what a lot of people are missing. So like when you have a venison burger with no fat cut into it, it's like, eh, this isn't like really like a good burger. That's what I noticed about my elk is like, they're so lean. Yes. Just uh, a lot of the stuff that I've eaten, granted, I'm not the best person to prepare it, but it's, it's tough. It's tough and it's dry, mm -hmm. you know? And I was, I was like, uh, well, I think a lot of people overcook venison as well sure. because yeah. it's lean. Yeah. Um, like even ground meat, like if you do ground meat for like, um, tacos or something, sure. like, you know, you're just like, oh, I'm going to brown this. Thing. Like that stuff cooks super, super fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and then eventually you overcook it and it's tough and it's mm -hmm. dry and, you know, have, things. Have you ever like. had those ribs done like that? Mm -mm. Pretty cool. Yeah. No, yeah. that's all. Awesome. When you told me about it, I was like, that's awesome. Yeah. So as you were caping it down, have you, have you ever had? No, I mean, we had some sheep ribs out there. That's the first I've ever really, like yeah. we did it out of fire or whatever. Yeah. Cause you don't yeah. think of like, it, you know, there's not much meat. There. There's not a lot. Yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah, you got to do it just like the Indians did it. You know, this is how, this is how you do it. So you cut cut the ribs off. Yeah. You know, just get up to yeah. the, basically the back trap and, and hack them up with a sawzall. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big layer of fat on the outside of it. So you take all that off. And then it's just, I think you just did salt and pepper. Yeah. And then right on the fire, you know, basically blacken it on the on the fire. And like, it's just pretty, it's pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. Not a ton of meat. Like you said, you're kind of yeah. chawing them apart and there's like a, a real, like a tallowy, yeah. you know, that kind of gets in your mouth and stuff, but it's kind of a, kind of a spiritual, you know, yeah. like you should be doing that. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> no, I've not, I've not ever done that. I would assume elk probably has a decent amount of meat there. I'm sure. It's got more than a deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. They didn't do like, uh, the liver or anything. Uh, he saved the heart. Yeah, yeah, he's like my son will freak if I don't bring the heart home. So, interesting. I don't know how they did it, but yeah, because you know, they end up usually cooking it and making like deer heart sandwiches or something. Like the old timers used to make that stuff. All yeah. Over. Well, it's see, it's going to be expensive to ship that meat back. So, and I have deer here to shoot, so I yeah. told him just to keep it. You know? Yeah. And I, they'll use every part of it. You know, from he pointed out, and I've never had these before. The neck we usually just let sit. He's like, have you ever had those neck tenderloins? I was like, no. He's like, that's one of the best parts. Huh. I usually make like a neck roast. Yeah. Like I'll pull yeah, that like, off as like a, a lot of guys will grind roast. it. Yeah. 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 So you know what I'm talking about? The, mm -hmm. the neck loins mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had this. Yeah. I usually will have them in like a cro like do crock pot to do, you know, like French dip or some sort of roast based stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes me hungry, Nick. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Feeling that too. Another yeah. cool trick is that when you uh, fry your burger, if you just put it in a strainer and just rinse it, just you can just see the brown nastiness coming off. Really? That, that makes your burger taste a lot better for like tacos and stuff. Yeah. Then you just throw your taco seasoning in there. Huh. Um, yeah. So say that again. So when you fry your burger, you fry it and then stick it in a strainer and just put it in the sink and just rinse runs, it. run water over top of it and just after let that, you fried it. Yeah. After you fried it and just let that. Nastiness and then throw it back up. in the pan with your taco seasoning yeah, exactly. and stuff. Exactly. Yep. Oh, it kind of takes oh, that gamey you're taste talking about out of it the, if you don't like that gamey taste. You got, you're talking yeah. about ground burger. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Hmm. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. I think yeah. If you just learn a few few cool tricks like that, I yeah. mean, you'd be surprised how good that stuff can taste. I think people yeah. under season stuff too. We got to get Allie DeAndre's cookbook. I know that's out. I know yeah. it is out. Yeah. yeah. I don't I, know how much venison is covered in there. But a I'm lot, sure I think. Some good stuff. Yeah. A lot. But yeah, I think a lot of people just under season stuff. And then it's just like, I don't know. That's just kind of what you're dealing with, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's... S&P, baby. Down the hatch. Yeah. It is funny, though, because like w when we killed those mule deer in North Dakota, like, I mean, it was like a beast out there. And you're just like, yeah, this is like awesome. Eating the tenderloins. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Over the fire. And yeah, it's just something I think different about like what you're in. Even at like deer camp. Like if you're at deer camp, somebody kills and you pull, you know, backstrap off and you grow it up. Like it's just... It's just, just part different. Of it, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. just different. Out Dude, there. the first deer I ever shot, my dad, he didn't make me, but he's like, yeah, well, you have to take a bite of the heart, like a big, like raw. Like he pulled the deer out, wiped, wiped or pulled the heart out, wiped it off in the snow. And he's like, I think it's from a movie, like Red Dawn or something. Yeah. And so I did, yeah, I did. My first deer when I was 12, pulled that heart out of that doe and he gave it to me. I took a big old bite out of it. He's like, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> yeah. You idiot. He, 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 yeah. He made it seem like it was like family tradition. He's like, oh, we always, we always, we always do, do that. This, yeah. And then afterwards he's like, you're nuts, dude. It's yeah. wild. That's crazy. <laughs> hey, Ozzy Osbourne. Jeez. Yeah. 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 That's wild. No, I mean, I, I think I'll, I, everybody does different. Like a, a, a lot of people do uh, elk or deer liver. 
as well. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm just not a liver guy. Yeah, we didn't do anything like with the guts. We we, we gutted them and yeah, you know, pulled. I, we, he did want to save the heart, and I also wanted to see where I shot him, obviously. And it's it's funny, you know, it's not like I you can see the see through this, you know, and aim for the heart necessarily, but it's especially the angle that I hit that deer at because I hit him, uh, you know, quarter and away. Qu- yeah, quarter and away, and it was it was dark too, you know, yeah. so I was. Uh, towards the back of the rib cage, and it come out right there. Yeah, right in his armpit, basically, right in front of his front shoulder. And Did so- you catch close long? I don't know. You would think so. I, I don't know. Pro- you, probably. You yeah. basically, could, yes, you couldn't I, have missed close. I couldn't long have missed it to go through. I the couldn't heart. have missed it. But I, I, all I knew is when I found that heart, I was sucked my finger right in, right through, right through it. And yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Are you using that sever broadhead, or yeah, 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 okay. whacking with that sever. That was the, like the first thing I asked him. I was like, yeah. how that sever do? Uh, dude, that that arrow's never looked better. I mean, yeah. not that the broadhead necessarily determines how the arrow looks, but it was complete. I mean, goes Cover. through the heart. You know, it catches all that blood on the way out, yeah. and immediately we could see him spraying. Like, yeah, that's imme- awesome. Immediately, yeah. That's what I, I just put mine on yesterday. There's one your 175 t- titanium Dude, severs. Don't make sh- don't travel with those in your bow case if you're doing. I don't know if that was you I saw doing that. Broadheads in your on your arrows in your bow case. Well, I took the I took the foam out, so they're way up in there now. No, in your bow case, not in your. Oh, you yeah, know yeah. What I mean, yeah, like so because when I. Granted, I was flying; they were not as gentle on sure. the case, but I would get there, and some of my arrows would had fallen fallen out. out of them. Yeah, you don't want to lose broadhead and air like with your string. Yeah, no, that would be bad. Bad news. Yeah, yeah. yep, been there, done that. Yeah, have I went you back to grab my bow and it's in a hundred pieces? Yeah. Oh no! Out of your case? No, it wasn't in a case. It was in the back of my truck. Yeah, and I don't know even what it hit, but it was rubbing against something while I was driving, Ugh. and uh, yeah, it just got back there, and it was shredded wow yeah <laughs> it's not a good day yeah i was no. glad i was glad to it's funny to shooting your bow the first time you get somewhere especially <laughs> you know because I, I got up early and it's like the excitement's there too and there was you know we had guys in you know oh yeah as a part of that camp and and so like nerves are on and stuff and it's funny i almost ripped my rip right through your cams you know just from the excitement and stuff and then i'm like i'm just like okay calm down and everybody's watching and stuff those first couple shots once you, you yeah. travel with your bow and stuff are are edgy a lot of people don't shoot their bow when they get to somewhere and it's like man there's a lot of things that can happen in travel oh yeah you have to yeah yeah you have to the hunter podcast is brought to you by hoyt archery oh dude it's almost fall you and i are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new hoyt bows we're going to be shooting the rx7 carbon bow this year i know hoyt's also got the venoms out both equally smooth shooting quiet bows heck yeah man we got a convert on our hands this year we got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever a good friend of mine and uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. That's cool though, man. I can't. I like. That's just nuts how that all kind of played out. Oh yeah. Well, well. I know people want to hear the story and stuff, so I'll I'll save it for another one. Yeah. I'll, uh, I I kind of gave you the the gist there of how that happened, but fortunately, you know, for this conversation, I think we got them taken care of. Nice. It's gonna turn into an awesome pedestal mount. That'd be my. Fr- I've been in the back of my mind. I'm like, I'm gonna, you know, when I one of these deer that's deserving of it. I was like, he's he's getting a pedestal. Mm-hmm. So I just that one feels right. It'll yeah. look cool, man. It'll, uh, yeah, it's it's a cool something that you'll be able to look at every day when you walk in the house, and yeah, it's nice to to be able to see that and live back on it. Do you mount a lot of your own stuff? Uh, I've got the hides tanned, and they're in the freezer. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> got a <laughs> pile. last priority, yeah. right? Yeah, I've got a pile in the corner that needs to be <laughs> mounted. But yeah, does it is it weird though? Like you're like. You know, mount like, your, mounting your own stuff, or you're like, oh, I'm just not as into it, or do you? Oh no, I'd be into it. Yeah, yeah. but it's just why do something for free when I can do somebody else's sure. and get paid for it? You know, yeah. it's kind of one of those type of deals. Yeah. But yeah, I I even have a deer in the house right now that's just sitting on the form. You know, I've got the mm-hmm. just the blank form with a rack sitting on top of it. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just yeah. sits there. Were you gonna do that uh, caribou that you killed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I 
That was in I'm more too, into right? mounting that thing than anything. Yeah. yeah, it's just such a cool animal. It's in, yeah. it's in velvet. Yeah, that's awesome. And might be able to save the velvet on it. They're trying to up there. They sent it straight to Knight's Taxidermy to get it dipped or whatever. So, so they do that they, up there, and then they'll ship yeah, it back to you. Yep. So hopefully I'll be able to save that. That'll be a pedestal. Yeah. Yeah, that'll look awesome. Yeah. Oh wow. Yep. That'll look really cool. For sure. It's a big animal. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're honestly their bodies are not like super super big. Like they're, it just looks like their rack overpowers their body. Like when you see them walking around, they just I know. look it's like huge. goofy. Yeah, they just look huge, especially in velvet, you know, too. But yeah, I, I mean, it's a pretty good one that I shot actually. And I, I went up there just, I went to sheep hunt, you know, mm-hmm. not caribou hunt. And I was just, I had a tag just in case. I didn't care if I didn't get any or not. And uh, yeah, we just happened on this thing, and and basically the guy told me he's like, you better shoot that. That's a big one. Shoot, shoot that, that because, and I had no idea really what I was looking at. After you know, after the fact of seeing a bunch of them, I was like, "Well, okay, that was a good one." But yeah, mm-hmm. didn't know it at the time. Dang, yep. yeah, that's not. Yep. What's how long does that usually take from the time like, okay, you shot that, they have it, um, to get that back to your shop to actually start working on it? I think they're expecting sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay, yeah, so that's a while they have to get sealed in Alaska there, and then they'll ship it. Yeah, and is that federal policy for them that they have to do that? I think it's I think it's state state policy. Yeah, Yeah. so they do all that, then they ship that to you. So like the sheep, it'll actually have to have they drill a hole in it in the in the horn, and then they actually put a plug in there. Hmm. Um, yeah, and then they I'm not sure what they do with the wolf and the caribou, but yeah, they're Alaska has some pretty strict laws. Yeah, on all of that stuff, they're really. Yeah, they're really pretty strict thorough. Stuff, yeah, yeah, that's interesting yeah. to see how that all kind of plays out. You know, because I, I get it from like coming from an Africa or something, but you know, from Alaska, you wouldn't think that it'd be so strict to get back to you or time consuming. Yeah, you can get it sealed yourself and just bring it back on the plane if you want to, but yeah, you you better <laughs> you better yeah. be able to like jumping around through hoops and all kinds of stuff before you jump yeah on that seems it's, like too we much just weren't wanting to have but you got that. your meat back pretty quick yeah yeah we just loaded the meat right on the plane there we flew alaska and the whole way down through here and they're mm-hmm. just super used to that stuff like yeah um, yeah the lady we were uh, we were moving meat around there putting stuff on scales you know trying to max everything out because i mean it ain't the cheapest thing sure. around. Yeah. so we we figured out like our second bag you could have 100 pounds in there so we're trying to get just to load pounds. it all yeah up. just yeah. And they're just used to it. They're like, yeah, we get it. Yeah, mm. yeah. That makes Put it, it in nice. dry bags and just bring it home frozen. How was your flight with your bow and stuff? It's fine. Yeah? Easy. Yep. Yeah, easy peasy. Just check the stuff right in. SKB I, case? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, I put uh, two, I went out just, or Amazon, I bought two uh, locks. numerical code locks. Yeah, piece of cake, dude. I took a 50-pound big duffel, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with every, every, just everything, uh, my bag and, you know, everything in there, and... uh I just checked it. It was like an oversized item. I flew Delta because mm-hmm. uh, there was only. There so you checked your bow and you checked your that bag. And then I took my backpack. I way overpacked on street clothes. Yeah, yeah. I just had way too many. So I mean, I was really jamming my stuff up under the seat in front of me. Type yeah, of thing, you know. But um, yeah, no, no issues. Just checked it in and it, it, they dropped it right in. I was the, even surprised how how easy it is for like a gun. Like yeah. I was expecting way more, yeah. Because yeah. I've never flown with a gun, and it, it I didn't even take a gun. I was just watching my buddy or whatever, and yeah, I just fill out some paperwork and mm-hmm. check it in, and good to go. Just at the normal yeah. check-ins, like yeah, yeah, really, yeah. You just you open it up for them to look at, lock it up, and send mm-hmm. it back. Yeah, hmm. just like a specialty item. The yeah. o- the only thing I had to like change about how I was, and I always forget this, is if you're flying with lithium batteries, those can't be in can't your carry. Check. You have to check them. Oh no no, no yes, forget it. Can't me. check them. Got to be in your carry on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like when we go to Kansas and stuff, yep. my entire carry on's like lithium batteries. Well, so <laughs> like in, in my little tackle box where I have my my yeah. broadheads and knocks and stuff like that, I had three. Uh, well, I had a a, a couple uh, extra AAA batteries, and she, uh, he asked me, and I was already in a ration flush. She's like, "You don't have any lithium batteries in here, do you?" And I almost was like, "Nope," <laughs> but he's you know he's like, "They'll get confiscated if you do." So I, so I opened it up and pulled them out and put them in my because you had to check your broadheads and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was super nice to be able to, I don't usually check bags, so it was nice to throw my pocket knife in there and stuff, and I didn't feel like I was walking around naked the whole time while I was there. Yeah, that's a big, that's a good call. Because, well, normally we just try to check in, or uh, carry on everything. Mm-hmm. So, no knives. We got to go buy knives when we get there and Well, because usually, yeah, I fly southwest and you get a free carry-on or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't usually check stuff, but for yeah. something like this, you obviously have to. Huh. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of people just, it's the uncertainty of like, like you said, like I've never flown with a gun. I don't know what this is like, and they just don't want to do it. This is my first time, I think, flying, flying with, with, a, with bow? a bow. Yeah. Maybe there's been one other time. But did I, you drive to Kansas last year the second time? Mm-hmm. Oh, you did? Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and y- you you have to like if you're if you are on your own and you've yeah. got to like process the animal and take care of all that stuff. You, you, there's not really a choice. Like you kind of have. Yeah. To drive. Even if you rent a car, you still need like coolers and everything right. else. Right. All that stuff. And so, fortunately, on this one, you know, I was staying, uh, you know, w- with a buddy, and um, hmm. so he's able to kind of take care of some of that stuff for me. So that frees you up to be able to fly, which is huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, it's, uh, I think it is a lot of just people uncertain about it and, you know, yeah, driving always makes it easier in terms of your gear, but when you're driving, you know, 20 hours or whatever, it's not yeah, fun. hard to beat a flight. Yeah. Dude, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, European mounts? Um, I know I, I've done several myself and like they're, they have been for me anyways, like a big pain in the butt, but mm-hmm. as wall space kind of becomes an issue, you know, I, d- there's definitely deer, I don't know. It just, you know, you still want to memorialize the deer somehow. Oh, absolutely. Just... And when you, when you know, you know, it's like certain deer, I'm like, it's a pedestal or this one's, you know, Hey, shoulder mount, or eventually, you know, you shoot some, whatever they are, management deer or just whatever, you know, you're like, I, I still want to memorialize them, mm-hmm. but I'm going to do a, a European. I think it's a great option. Mm-hmm. Some advantages yeah. actually, even over shoulder mounts that I can pick them up and I you know, they're more transportable. They, they take up less space. Yep. Absolutely. Um, how, how do you recommend, you know I mean? I guess my process for those has been, I bought a turkey fryer, like a mm-hmm. uh, turkey fryer and it's got, you know, propane flame underneath of it. And I bring that sucker to a, a boil is how I've done it. And, and I hear some guys say, Oh, you know, don't boil them. It'll they'll get brittle and stuff. Or, you know, just do it for an hour hasn't been the case for me i'm like to get that thing clean i feel like i have to literally boil it for hours yeah, yeah like and, all day <laughs> and they do get brittle and it's a pain in the butt that water boils over and i was talking to your brother a little bit he said you guys have bought a thing that's that's more of like a it's it's a it's a a more controlled water uh it's, they're not boiling right but it's it's close yeah so there's there's a couple different ways you can you can boil them actually and it can work really good and i i would not recommend bringing it to a full boil, Mm -hmm. maybe just like a light simmer. Yeah. But the biggest thing is, so get every speck of meat that you can cut off first. Yep. That's where, that's probably why you have to boil it too long. So take the eyes out, take the brains out. The brains are really greasy, so you don't want that in there anyway. So just take How a, do you get the brains out? See, I can't get the brains out until I've boiled it because they so got such a, a small wire, hole. Put a wire on a drill in a drill and just make a loop on the end and just stick it in there and just start. On a drill. Just start churning it up. Mm. And mm-hmm. uh, just. Brain, it, brain stew. Yep. Is what they're Chur- talking about. Stir mm. that stuff up till it's like, it's just like water in there and then just dump it out. Ugh. Yep. I mean, doing skulls is not a pretty deal. It's not pretty, <laughs> it's just dude. Not it's not pretty not. any way you look at it. Yeah. It's a little bit of a yeah. lobotomy yeah. there. Dude out in a yard. Yeah. And I mean, it's, yeah, it's wicked. I've, I've got a, all these tools. I got pliers. I got, you know, hangers. I got it. Yeah. And it's never easy. I always end up busting, more times than not, I end up busting off one or both of those, uh, you know, the, whatever that you would call those, the, on the nose, on like the, coming around. Yeah, the longer nose bones. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Because yeah, I, yeah. the cartilage yeah. boils out to a point where they just yeah they fall out and i just i end up super, and they should super because there's only in. there's grease that's holding those in so mm-hmm. those i mean when we do it when we beetle them and degrease them those all come out okay yep teeth will fall out the you nose know. are the nose is really hard to do because i really want to keep those fine bones intact like inside really cool yeah, yeah. a well, lot of guys i think are just sticking screwdrivers up in there yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> i've busted a few you know? well i'll tell you a way you can do that too but the, but the whole boiling method you know if you if you cut all the meat off and and everything you you'll be surprised like you won't have to keep it in near as long Mm -hmm. and that that'll help you out on that but i've been telling customers and whatever guys that want to do their own the best way that i know that they can do it is maceration um and you can look it up online or whatever but i'll just give you a brief rundown basically it's making bacteria eat all of the meat and everything off the skull so you take a five gallon bucket say Put your put your skull in there. Fill it up with water till it just comes to the base of the antlers, and then uh, put an aquarium heater or if it's like warm like outside right now, just set it outside. You want to keep the water like eighty to ninety degrees, and that makes bacteria grow really fast in there. Mm. Um, you basically so you're gonna do just like you did with uh, with the boiling skull. You'll just cut all the eyes out, take the mm-hmm. brains out, cut everything off you can, set it in there, put water up. 
up to the antlers and heat it to 80, 90 degrees and just let her set for a week. Um, pull it out. Most of the time, if the bacteria worked really well, you'll lift it out of that water and there is not a speck of meat on there. Whoa. Um, you, you said an aquarium heater? Maybe two weeks if you're a little bit on the cool side. Yeah, okay. aquarium heater works. I Got bet it. it smells right. It does. It does. It it smells really bad. <laughs> Don't do bad. it in your living room. Really Nick. bad when you take it out. So you just pull it out of there and uh, take how, a pressure how, how washer. Do those, how do those work? Those aquarium heaters? You're going to a pressure washer? Yeah, not not right up next to it. But yeah, just back off a little bit and just wow. basically clean everything off that's maybe <laughs> stuck to it a little bit. Uh huh. And then from there, I would recommend guys go from there into like a, a boiling pot and maybe put some Dawn in there. Just a and clean, just, just to a, grease it. Yeah, just a simmer, just a low simmer. Put it in there for 20, 30 minutes, and that'll get some of the grease out of there. Yeah. Um, and so then, you're not picking anything off. No. You're, you you're cutting it initially nope. straight into maceration, pressure wash from a distance if, into a finishing boil with some Dawn. Yep. yep. And then after that, you know, you go through your whitening process, which, you know, I just tell guys, go to Sally's Beauty and yeah. buy that 20 volume yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Dump it in there. Isn't you that can, funny? Did you got imagine them girls that work at Sally Beauty? Like one time a year, you got these dudes walking well, in funny. there. They, they know me in there. Like, they're yeah, like, yeah. oh, you know, here yeah. he comes again. <laughs> yeah. Because I just buy massive amounts just of it. Just buy a know? ton of it. Yeah. <laughs> Take everything you got. Yeah. That's but you can fun. cut that half with water yep. and uh, and just bring it. We actually like to heat that up too because that when you heat that stuff up, it works. It, it makes it work mm. way better. Mm. Um, heat that stuff up. You don't want to let that stuff, your skull in there too long. But just let her in there for How do you do 15, that? 20 minutes. How do you heat it up? Oh, turkey fryer. Yeah. In a, in a pot. So you'll yeah. mix that that whitener in water. Yep. Oh. And then you're sitting that in into it. Because mm -hmm. so, I, oh. I think I've painted, I painted it, it on. on. Room yeah. temp. You can do that, but it doesn't work nearly as well. Huh. Because when you when you boil it or, or simmer that stuff, yeah. you got to be careful because the stuff's kind of flammable. I mean, don't do it <laughs> close to any building or anything. But... uh. Yeah, just do it outside and just stick that stick that skull in there, and it just it goes right. Into How do you that protect bone. the base of the antlers? You can't hundred percent. You're gonna have to restain the bottom of the antlers pretty much in any European method. Okay. Yeah, I mean you, you might you be able to because I usually am like bagging it and foil and rubber yeah. bands, and it's just a shit show. Yeah. How and, would a guy go about restaining? Um, I mean, I have I have antler stains, so it's not a big deal to me. But I would say. Which you could buy online, I Yeah, think. I would just go ahead and get the little Walmart latex paints, and you can mix them with water and thin them down. That would work pretty well. Oh. Um, or, you know, just use regular walnut stain that you can buy, you know, and just darken Lowe's them or up. anywhere, yeah. Would you yeah. try to you try to protect? I mean, I can imagine. I would Because I, I painted but, that stuff on, and it was I was really careful about getting up to the base of the pedicle, so I've never had an issue, but I can imagine sticking in a vat. Because I think I painted yeah. that one. Yeah, that one looks good. Yeah, it's it's not We've too got, complicated. They're pretty fact, easy to Hey paint. Nick, can you grab that uh Jeremy's this mountain deer? Yeah, I'll try and It should be it. in there. It's uh, I think uh, it's the only yeah, European. Yeah, yeah. I did yeah. I did that one for you yeah. with the method that I described. Yeah. But the good way about that good thing about that mm. maceration is it'll keep all of those inside nose bones just like beetles mm. will. We have the we literally have the beetles and it's a trap. Yeah, that's the mountain buck. Did you boil this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, you kept most of the nose bones in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. I so we had a guy start with beetles, and it he cut that skull like that, and okay. the beetles didn't do anything either. It did. I yeah. just I don't know mm -hmm. what we did wrong there. Didn't work, but that so and I painted that with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Didn't dip it in anything. Just boiled it. Yep. Pull on stuff. That I mean, I good. like the boil. The I mean, obviously that'd be a hell of a lot easier just to boil it in that whitening and then pull it out. Mm -hmm. I did. I didn't even think about. Yeah, because again, I'm always like, how oh, you got to protect these things. Like, mm -hmm. well, you know, it I didn't sounds even like think you about want to as much as you can. Yeah, I would say do if you can, but you're pretty much like you're some some of these pedicles go on an angle, and you're just gonna have. Yeah, to Yeah, there's it in no the way. Water. Could yeah. you do like um, some sort of like a ziploc, like a that's what I did. Cut it and then like rubber band real tight underneath the pedicle. I don't know if that would keep water out or not. Well, I kinda, and and then still only submerge it to like here or so, okay. And then use a paintbrush while it's in. I there. know what you can do too is set it in there and then just put lay a lay a rag on top of here, mm -hmm. and then that'll just leach that stuff up. Yeah, over the leach top. it up over the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That works too sometimes. And then you don't you're not painting or anything. You just pull it out and it's good to go because you've dry you've, it. Yep. Dry it. Mix it, it with water, it. like fifty fifty with water. Yeah, I'd pour like a gallon of that twenty volume in gallon of water and just fill it up till you. So you're good to go. Okay. See, I've never yep. bought a 
gallon of that stuff. It comes in. What, I, what I, I get the I buy the powder one where I have to like mix it. Yeah, mix it together. And that's what I'm painting on usually. You have preference with powder or? I mean, it sounds like the both liquid them, would be. Both of them work fine. The only reason I like the other is that it goes into the bone and sure. it actually whitens way down inside. Oh. Yep. And you, and the beauty yeah, of the yeah, because you'll see that sometime. Like, uh, what do you mean the other? The reason Nick, you like Nick what? Grab that one for me. The reason I like the the um the liquid, is because when you boil that, it goes into the bone, versus the powder is just laying on the outside. Yeah, so it's like, not going down inside. You oh. can see like after it sits for a while, because it's not going down inside. Like you you start to see some of these dark spots come back out because it's not sunk down into the bone there. And that much. that is grease too. And mm. you're you're walking a fine line there because. If you take all the grease out of a skull, that's when it gets brittle. Okay. But if you let too much in, then that's when it gotcha. Start, starts so when you do the Dawn nasty. dish soap side, leave it in enough that you're getting some of that grease out, but not. Yeah, and, and the it maceration all. method. That's the reason I love the maceration method that grease. because bacteria eats grease too, so it's going to eat a bulk of that grease out of there. Mm. Whereas the beetles, they're just going to eat the meat off of there and then they're done. Mm -hmm. You know, they they leave all that grease in there. Um, so, I mean, we, we use beetles, we still do for some things, but, um, yeah, I would much rather use the maceration method, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, I know. That I sounds a lot better. That, that's the biggest question. The biggest issue that I was having was with boiling and boiling. Every time it would, I'd try to get it to a simmer, but it's five gallons of water and mm -hmm. it's tall and it's awkward. Yeah. So, it boils over, then it puts your flame out, and then you're like, oh, it's, cold, it's cold again, and it's just yeah. like not, <laughs> yeah. not smooth. So, that, that aquarium heater or whatever you're talking about, is that's a a big part of that. Yeah, yeah. I wonder with that. Or anything to keep it 80 to 90 degrees, whether that's, we have actually, we built, I built a little room that we just keep 80 to 90 degrees and then we just set our buckets in there. So we don't have to deal with the aquarium heaters anymore. One of the ones that I would think of too, and they're cheap, they're like 10 bucks at Rural King is I have a, a water heater for my chickens yep. so that it doesn't freeze. You could submerge that thing down in there and I think it keeps it in like the mid eighties, basically temp wise. Can you control that at all? In terms of the temperature, it yeah. just it just throws like it doesn't heat consistently heat 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 to boil. It just keeps it warm so hmm. it doesn't freeze. Um, yeah, and I assume most room temp water is like seventy something degrees, anyways, right? Sixty seventy degrees, probably. So yeah. if you put a little bit of heat in there, it's probably going to set it. Yeah, I mean eighty. Like I've I know I've tested it in the winter time. Like it's usually eighty two, eighty five, something like that. Yeah, there you on go. That. Perfect. One of my customers actually used a light bulb. He built a little box with that two inch <laughs> foam. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> actually, you threw a hair dryer not in there. Down in the water. <laughs> a toaster? Not down in the water. <laughs> but he just he just lights yeah, it up lights on it top down. with a light bulb, and yeah. that oh, just yeah. keeps his little a heat, box a heat warm. lamp. Heat lamp, yeah. Yep. Keeps his little box warm, and he said it works great. I bet it does. That's the cool thing about this. I mean, it's super easy, and I've I've told a lot of customers, and they've had no issues doing it. They they love it. So nice. there's yeah, a, I mean, lot it works for a lot of guys that don't want to mess with it though, and they're going to bring it to you, <laughs> dude. I've got a skull sitting outside my house right now that Pastor Don shot that I just am dreading, dude. It's been sitting out there for a year, just rotting, macerating on its own. <laughs> on it, it's it's weird. It doesn't smell at all. It just no. Birds pick the eyes out and stuff, and yeah. it's just there. Yeah. Once they get too dried out, that grease will lock in that bone, and it's hard to get. It's it hard out. to get yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah. Fresh is best. Yeah. No, I mean it's yeah. it's a it's a cool. Like I've done mine. The kids have their box and stuff, so I've done skull mounts with it, and it's just you know, it's just something that like to your point. I think once you get so many deer mounted, or or depending on wall space or what you want, I mean it's it's a cool thing because it used mm -hmm. to be back in. Yeah, you know, the deer camp days, it was just all skull caps. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole wall at deer camp was just skull caps yeah. on everything. Like, you never even really saw anybody do they had the old, the old felt. Oh, yeah. The old felt, the old felt on, the, on the walnut, Classic. you know, plaque. Classic. I actually do a, a European type for a guy where I actually do a European and then cut it basically, you know, straight across. Yeah. Halfway through the eye. Yeah. And then he sets them on his table. Yeah. Oh. That's actually a cool thing, too. Yeah, that's neat. I've seen, and I will do one at some point. It's uh, I think it's Rack Hub that makes those. It's, it's a base, right? It's just mm -hmm. a, a table that's base. on the table. It comes up and it holds a European, you know, on the table, okay. just, yeah. just about like this. And yep. they look really cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the hanging side of things is the next thing. It's like, you know, three-inch screw into the wall and then trying to, like, weasel it in there. Into the brainstem area. There are, there's quite a few, I think, companies New that hangers, make bases. Yeah. Ah, some of them I don't like, though. Like the, this is it Skull Hooker. Mm -hmm. It just, it's too, too artsy for me, too kind of Western style mm -hmm. on it. There's some, there's a couple other ones. There's that TK Mounts, I remember. Yeah. There's probably some other really, is there one that you prefer? I don't know. I mean, 
I don't use a ton of those, like yeah. those metal ones. Yeah. I have wood ones that, you know, I design and I have guys make or whatever. But, okay. yeah, other than that, I don't. I've done mine on wood plaques, like, for the wall for, like, the kids and stuff. Yeah. I really like them on driftwood and stuff, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They look oh, cool yeah. to That'd stick one cool. of those little brackets on driftwood and hang sure. them up there. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. <laughs> I did it. Excuse me. I got a... <laughs> you all right? <laughs> choking on my own. Ah! <laughs> I got a really heavy-duty <laughs> one for that elk. Oh, yeah. So I did a European yeah. on my elk in that five-gallon, you know, de- I did it the same way I, I described <laughs> And it was, you know... I remember you boiling that thing on your back porch. <laughs> Man, it was, it's a process. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I'm really looking forward to doing it this way. But I got a big, I, I don't remember the brand that I bought, but it was like a, a thing that you stuck down in that hole in the back of the skull and mm-hmm. then it screwed on. Yeah. So it was locked in or it could not come out. And then that hung on a, so it was a loop on the back of the skull that was snug and then hung on a hook. Yeah. And that's worked really well. Yeah. I've seen those, but I, I don't forget what they're called, but yeah, those look really good. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. It's just, they're discreet. Like I don't, mm-hmm. I don't want that hook to be like a part of the display i just want it yeah. to be yeah it doesn't need to be like a big 12 inch yeah that's what i don't like about the skull hooker ones is they're just it's like they're you know mm-hmm. obnoxious kind of mm-hmm. yeah 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 europeans are kind of starting to become a big thing like there's a lot of guys starting to do a lot they're more awesome of them. they just yeah. they look cool you know and you can still grab them and hold on to them and mm-hmm. well it used to be a guy killed like one buck every five to ten years you know and now like guys are killing them every year yeah and you can only do so many mounts and yeah the price keeps going up higher and higher, and yeah, eventually and you got to move guys get someday, out, right? Yeah. And it's yeah, they're yeah. a pain in the butt. Nice to haul them around. Yeah, the Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least ten years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time, and I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch, but yeah, they, they've come a long way, and certainly the box blinds are are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a muddy box by a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. And this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm-hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code. Save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. So, Trav, I know um, just because I've bought some stuff, there there seems to be just like a handful of suppliers for a lot of your taxidermy equipment, right? Like, I know Ohio Taxidermy Supply is one. Mm-hmm. What, McKenzie mm-hmm. is another one. They're the one that's buying up a lot of the others. McKenzie yeah. is mm-hmm. just kind of trying to... D- you know, monopolize yeah. it necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, These are mainly farms and eyeballs and stuff you're talking about. At least that's what it seems like. OTS, from McKenzie. Yeah. yeah. Those are the two that I am most familiar mm-hmm. with. At least. Yeah, there's a few others out there, you know, smaller ones. Yeah. You know, Joe Coombs. There's different ones. Yeah. Headquarters. And there are certain ones that you find like, oh, you know, I want to get my eyes from here, my forms from here, mm-hmm. whatever. Because I know like, like even when I did the pedestal mount, um, Andy was like, you know, like here's a bunch of different forms that to choose from basically. Yeah. Yeah. I like to use Ohio taxidermy supply because I, I like to be able to pick them up for number yeah, one. local. And I think they make the best whitetail form as, as far as that goes. Um, and they fit really nice. I would, I would literally rather take their form and alter it into another pose. If I have to, I just did that yesterday. We cut up a form and made it into a form that I could have just bought at McKenzie, but you know, then I have to, if I buy a McKenzie, I have to do things to change it, to make mm-hmm. it how I want it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just, we all have our preferences. Everybody has their preferences. Jeff has his preferences. You know, that's, that's not a high taxidermy supply form. That's one of the other Epley's. Mm. Um, you know, he likes those and I like Ohio taxidermy supply. And do you think he did good. that out of preference or because that thing is like a scrawny neck? Like it's, you know, cause it wasn't, yeah. he didn't have any you can, t- testosterone. You can buy all different sizes for, for each one, you know? Yeah. So that's not, Oh. Size wise, you don't buy you don't buy another form just because of the size. Normally, here's a good question I forgot to ask earlier: is uh, measurements. So if guys are caping their own stuff out, mm-hmm. are there measurements that they should take before they start cutting into and you know, uh, you you can. I don't necessarily need a measurement. Like uh-huh. so, 
I know some guys want to leave a bunch of neck in so you can measure it. Mm -hmm. Um, in my opinion, that a neck measurement is kind of, I don't know, give or take, because if you hang a deer upside down and put ice in it, it gets the size of Texas. The yeah. neck does. Or if you let it lay around, it shrinks down. So yeah. like it's it's a measurement that we usually take, but we don't totally rely on it, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. I, I do a lot of test fitting when I get them back from the tannery and thin them out. Okay. Um, you know, to test the shoulders, test the neck, test, test the head or whatever. You probably can't trust us either to give you a measurement. And you're like, oh, uh, yeah, Yeah, sure. usually guys I are like, he's writing it down. Yeah, that's definitely what it yeah, is. 37, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I've had a lot of 30-some inch neck white tails. You yeah, know, exactly. Biggest, biggest they make might be a 22, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, It's kind of one of those deals, but yeah. It just depends where you measure stuff and, right. and all of that. And, you Easy know, if you're measuring outside you the hair, doing. it's different than if you're so measuring So once the you have that cape, you're actually going on and, and test forming it to say, okay, I need a mount that's got whatever, 20-inch neck and this in the shoulder. And, you know, we usually measure right underneath the jaw, mm -hmm. right around right around the uh, tightest, right behind the ears, yep. the tightest part. You know, that's a pretty reliable measurement there. Okay. Um, so you can start with that. But then once it comes to the neck swell on the shoulders, you know, that measurement is we take it, but it's not something we totally would, mm -hmm. would bank know, on. Because a lot form. of times you're taking clay to form that area, right? Not too much. I mean, you can buy a lot of different sizes of forms now. Okay. Um, to where you can pretty much buy what you want, but we do have to some. Okay. Yeah, so you're to trying to buy a form that is as close to fitting on that cape as possible. Exactly. Yep. Wow. That seems like they would have a ton of different you know, options then. I mean, you think of the variation in some of these yeah, deer. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can't, like, so there's some deer with stubby short noses. There's some deer with long skinny ones. Um, that can be done if I have a picture or mm -hmm. if I have the deer in my hands. But obviously if I just get a skin, I'm just going to do it like what's typically sure. a deer. But yeah, a lot of, there's, I've had customers, you know, they'll, they'll give me a picture, you know, trail camera pictures or whatever. And, you know, give me the shape of the deer's head and, and all of that. And, uh, I can I can make it look like that, you know. Usually, hmm. is that yeah. helpful? Like it is, a it picture is, yeah. of the deer. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. I know. For I'll sure. give you that with the so the velvet. It's just kind of if I just handed you the bag of velvet, like you'd have no idea. Yeah, where exactly. it was or how it was on. So I'll, yeah. I'll give you that. Maybe that maybe that'll help. But yeah, um, dude, how long does it take you to to actually do like once you get the thing back? You know, you've got the hide. You've got you know from mm -hmm. from start to finish. Like how much? How many hours does it actually take to to do them out? With the system we got right now, I usually figure about eight. Yeah, I have eight hours between me and Zach. Wow, that's you know, more, way more than I thought, actually. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. So what do you, you plan on, like, one a day? Like, you can kind of crank out? So I, I do them in stages. So we will prep a bunch of forms and get them all ready, get the hides ready. So Zach will, Zach will sand my forms. I'll carve in everything how I want it. And then I'll, I'll have, like, a week where I'm just putting them together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll do anywhere from... 10 on the low side to have done as many as 20 if I really want to get after it. Mm -hmm. um, so then after that's <clears throat> after that's done, then, you know, you have to let them dry. You're going over them a little bit as they're drying. And then, uh, yeah, basically after that, it's let them dry and finish work. Yeah. So And, and I spend about trying... as much time on finish work as I do actually mounting them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're just trying to ba set up a batch and then just exactly. move through those stages. So It's, it's all about efficiency with deer yeah. because, yeah, that's – it, if you weren't efficient at it, you wouldn't make any money at it because sure. taxidermy is, it's all about efficiency and, and a lot of that stuff. Yeah, that sounds you know. right. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like at this point, you got to have a pretty repeatable process. Like, it's not like, yeah. oh, yeah. what do I do here? You're like, this I is do what, it. This I do it in the exact same order usually. You know, when I sew it up, when I put the ears on and everything is all in the same order usually. Yeah. Yep. Even, it, even the way that I, we use a seven cut on the top of the heads. You know, I start at a certain side and go back because I'm left-handed and it makes it all easier for me. Hmm. So usually when somebody else skins a deer out, I'm like, uh, I can tell I didn't skin it out or we didn't skin it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Right. Yeah. Is it like to the point now, are there still things that like you can mess up on or you're like, I'm not totally happy with how that turned out or is it just, it is what it is? And it's They're never per like, they're just, you can try as hard as you want and they're just never going to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's always, it's always a fight. Even competition mounts, you know. You're just driving yourself nuts trying to get them perfect, and it just they just never are. Never yeah. are. Yep. yep. So you said seven mount. You're talking about between the pedicles and then back. Yeah. That cut exactly. there. I noticed yours were cut like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they. I think that's what Andy told me to do, and that's what I've always stuck with is yeah. a seven cut. You like a seven? 
Yeah, yeah, that's my favorite. Versus, the, yeah, I don't a like a Y cut or yeah. Y. Yeah, I just don't like that point out there because it's just a hard place to thin, uh, and then it's it's a hard uh, it's a hard thing to sew and get flat. Real, I mean, you can, but it's so yeah, so that's for, for our hairs. listeners, like what we're talking about is if you're gonna cape cape the deer out, there's the seven cut is you basically you know you stick your knife in right as close as you can to one pedicle and mm-hmm. and run a line straight across to the other mm-hmm. one and then from that point you bring it back down into the center of the head behind it right mm-hmm. so it's, you, you literally make a seven mm-hmm. yep and the main reason i like when customers do that is so on a if a deer's ear is right here and you do a y cut a lot of guys will start back here too far and then when i'm sewing i'm jammed up jammed underneath up underneath there, there. trying to get my sti- my stitching yeah uh, in there and if you do a seven cut everything is on top up in the open when mm-hmm. you get to it really nice. easy as far as like towards the front or towards the back where would you you know on the top of the seven where's your two points if you can point to those basically right right in the center you know right just go from the center right and even, on top like the yep, highest it point. doesn't matter it doesn't matter where it is in fact for competition sometimes we'll go here and here just so it's odd something different and then they the, the judge won't be able to find it as easy sometimes um, but and there's nice long fur in but, terms of the the stitching that's going to be able to yeah. overlap. I mean, but, the only reason I say that is it doesn't matter where it is, to be honest with you. Um, but if but you just go straight across, you want to go back with the seven, right? Not exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you go straight across. Then I usually drop back a half inch and start another cut and come back to the center and back. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Gotcha. So not necessarily point to point to point, point to point, half inch. Yeah. To back point. How far back on that back one do you come? As far as it takes to get around the the back of the, the neck. The back of the neck and so out the only around. reason the only reason you're cutting that is so that you can peel it forward. So mm-hmm. if you did a good job and you skinned it all the way to the base of the skull and cut it off, that doesn't have to be very long. Right, because um, it's it's right there coming like out and three, around. Three, four inches? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. plenty. Okay. Yep. Versus if you leave a lot more neck, you're cutting a... A uh, ten inch. And to usually, try to get well, I mean, if the neck's this long, we'll have to skin the neck down, recut it. Yeah, you know, because I don't want to. I don't want to seem that yeah. long. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty amazing how you guys can stitch that stuff up. Like I've seen holes. I'm like, geez, I don't know how you're gonna fix that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've never been able to tell though. You know. Yep. It varies a lot on the deer. Like earlier season, the cape is, you know, and and uh, September capes are. It's pretty critical that you try not to make holes, but sure. Yeah. And, an, and a hole from the outside is much worse than a hole from the inside. Guys freak out when they're skinning a deer. Oh, it's I made hair. a nick in it. A little nick in a, in a November cape means nothing. I mean, yeah. it's so easy to fix. Yeah. It's not. But yeah. a coming in like an actual broadhead or bullet hole. Yeah, two-inch rage through the neck or something <laughs> like that. That's that's rough. <laughs> yeah, I'll get you. I think I did. Uh, it's one of those ones over there. Was that Kansas buck I hit with a rage? It, I was on the ground, and it wheeled towards me, and I so I caught it in through here. Yeah. And I mean, it had like mine did a too. gaping hole like that. that. Yeah, one seventy. Yeah. I don't remember seeing anything though, because I it, dr- I no, drilled it, it right in the front shoulder. Yeah, it doesn't bother me as long as it's up in like the shoulder hair or something like that. Versus like, like once it gets down in the brisket area, it gets a little sketchy because you get into hair patterns. Here. You get into hair patterns that when you start robbing yeah. skin to pull the skin, it'll thing break together. the pattern. Yeah, and it's mm. it's hard to get everything yeah. to lay nice. Mm. You do yeah. all that by hand, like all like a suture oh, kit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yep. Needles. You sell your own clothes too? No. No. <laughs> Not even repairs? No. Oh, no. buddy. Stuff's Damn. too cheap for that. Yeah. <laughs> Fair nice. Fair uh, enough. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. that would be a big one. I think people would <laughs> would freak out about is like you know oh I've got this gaping hole here or whatever. Well, you needed it to kill the deer, but. Spe- yeah. Speaking of those outside cuts, I know a lot of guys will throw a loop like a ratchet strap or oh, something yeah. around the neck. Oh, to yeah. pull their deer out. You're making me cringe just thinking about it. Yeah. Not good, huh? Yeah, no, not good. Yep, deer hair's hollow and it can break. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So Rats you, so you recommend grabbing by the, the horns. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Don't touch the hide if you can help it. Yeah, I mean, you can touch the hide. It doesn't hurt it. Sure, but... Yeah. But yeah. Don't throw preference, a around of, it. preference of no dragging versus dragging. I've yeah. seen guys hang them up like that, too. They'll put a loop oh, around yeah. them and then, you know... They do that a lot in bear camps. And, yep. and literally, there will be a mark all the way around the neck, like, where it's just... Yeah, not much nasty, you can do yeah. good to know so yeah. don't do that yeah don't do that yeah you know even your bucks yeah. i've seen guys probably the worst thing is they they'll put them around the base of like the pedicles and stuff that probably messes them up too honestly huh? i don't think that hurts it too bad yeah okay. more on yeah. the actual cape itself yeah yeah we're usually you know gamble through the back legs and up mm-hmm. what i'm talking about is some guys will put a ratchet strap they'll like figure eight <laughs> it on the ha- hair of the head yeah you know yeah 
Don't yeah, do I mean, there, I've had guys, you know, wrap around the neck with a rope and drag them out with a four wheeler. Yeah, and then turn around and get back to the house or whatever, and they pull it up and it's just rubbed down oh. to nothing, just skin. It's just like my worst yeah. nightmare, man. This, <laughs> the, the amount of time and money and mm-hmm. effort and you know just everything that goes into yeah. killing a deer, you know, and then to to mess it up because yeah. you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. It's just and there's ways around it. You know, you can do a wall pedestal. You know, where that side of the shoulders against the wall. So. There's there's ways to kind of finagle things and get around. It here, I can say to, this while Jeremy's not here, and then he'll come in and bust me. <laughs> I shot a buck in Kansas. Uh, it's uh, like a 140 inch eight point yeah. s- several years ago, and I had never I hadn't caped anything at that time. So he's like, oh yeah, I'll show you how to do it. So he starts caping this thing for me, and, he, and and he gets it down to like about the eyes, and I I don't know if he got frustrated or he's just rushing or yeah. hacked him right off, you know. And so I, I'm looking at the thing afterwards, and I'm like on the carcass that's hanging there there's like all kind of skin around the eyes and stuff yeah. and he's like oh yeah tax term fix that i'm like okay <laughs> and i think i i think it was jeff i took it to and he's like no dude i he's like there's nothing i could do for this so yeah i there's actually a different height on that yep yep it happens but yeah i mean when you're skinning out a deer like that i mean usually the worst places the easiest places to make a mistake are like the eyes and uh that's that's probably the worst <laughs> did you hear that yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I threw you under the bus for hacking my eyes off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always tell which, guys. Which just, deer was that? The Kansas deer? Yeah, that like Kansas eight. Yeah, well, like I said, we were probably nine beers deep by that point. Oh yeah, I ended up using one of Steve's hides. What did we cut off? The eyelashes? You cut off the eyelashes. No, it doesn't sound right. <laughs> Usually, it's the back corner of the eyes. Like a lot of a lot of you know the elk that I get in, they'll have the back corner cut off, and it's yeah. because you're skinning down. Yep. All of a sudden, you bump into the eye, and you didn't realize it was there. I always tell guys just reach your finger up in there and grab it and just don't cut your finger. So yeah. Yeah. You'll stay away from your finger usually. Yeah. Yeah. Just do You've it done way. some sense. We, we've, yeah. Honestly, though, if I can help it, if I can get it to like to, oh, to you agree. or a taxidermist that knows what they're doing, I'd, ra- I'd we rather. We pretty much just have to do all of our Kansas deer. I mean, the two that he just did, I yeah, we had to do. Yeah. Because we're just bringing them back with cape and antler. There's no cap. other choice, right? There's no way from well, the CWD standpoint to to they're, do that there actually is so i'm certified to take cwd or in cwd in from out of state oh you are in ohio we can do that now i do not know about other oh, we states. can't transport them how would you how do you get them like if so, we shoot a buck in kansas there there are some regulations as long as they get it to you it's legal that you well, have no, it, it's just not transport. Yeah. It, it, there is something <laughs> there is something around that and i don't know what it is i did it when i shot a deer in kansas and i took it to missouri is I could take the full thing to Missouri as long as the certified taxidermist then caped everything and took everything oh, with mm-hmm. them. Once they have it in their possession, then I'm clean and free yeah. from that stuff. Um, now, you couldn't take the whole deer across because Trav's not going to take all the spinal tissue and everything like that. But if you caped it up to the head and then gave that whole head to him, I think that there is a legality around that that he's now certified and in charge of that we basically have to dispose of it properly correct you know it has to be double bagged and it has to go to a certain landfill and everything and honestly i think it's a really good thing because there were a lot of guys i think that just kind of realized that they can't bring it across state lines and all of a sudden they're trying to find a taxidermist no taxidermist would take it because we don't want to get in trouble and so they'd skin it behind their house or whatever and just chuck the stuff so in my eyes, it's better to take oh, yeah. it to somebody that's certified and at least it's getting disposed of properly. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that's part of the spread of it is is guys who are just, you know, they don't know where to take it. They cut it up. They throw it behind their, their house and that deer is CWD. Now you just yeah. drop that into that area. And in my opinion, that's better than like, so when we're in Wyoming or wherever, um, you know, we keep everything right. The, the guy out there actually told us, he's like, just do it right in the field and let everything lay right where it is. You know, and in my opinion, it's better to bring it back to one spot sure put it in a landfill you know rather than sure. just letting it lay Spreading all across it all the countryside the place. you know yeah i i don't know like the laws have kind of keep kept changing they back have. and forth and it's just like i, I don't know anymore yeah mm. yeah they are changing i was reading on the way back uh, on the plane i saw minnesota starting with their first crossbow season mm-hmm. it, it, it's infused it's now part of the archery season this year you see that yes that was in the same discussion we had uh, around the baiting versus feeding in Minnesota. Minnesota. Like those states opened up feeding, but not baiting during mm-hmm. the season. Gotcha. Whatever. Gotcha. So, but yeah. Any pulse on like what's happening there with, uh, in Ohio, as far as 
like the CWD thing mm -hmm. and and or baiting and or you know how all that stuff's kind of going as far as the CWD I think it's pretty much contained to one area out there there's a few counties and yeah. honestly I think there's mainly one county where it is right now which um, is it uh, Mahomes like like or no 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 no, no. it's like Mary even, Marion or something yeah maybe? and then they they actually make they which put the counties the around it they kind of started taking those north, deer out too northwest of Columbus okay yeah yep yeah but because that's where you sent me the early rifle season and stuff they're having now in those disease management areas in Ohio. Yep, that's what you texted me the other day, dude. I saw something else the other day that Pittsburgh's looking for like uh, thirty bow hunters. Oh yeah, for the first. I tried to click the link and it didn't work. Yeah, and all the in all the parks downtown. I was like, I'd be up for that. Yeah. So, but yeah, they're they're I, as of right now, I think it's just those three counties in Ohio. But uh, Ohio as a whole has the CW. Like you can't bring a deer in. And dispose of it from another state that has CWD. Same with Pennsylvania. So, so how would that work then? As far as like, if we wanted to bring a deer caped up to the neck back to you, on my part, it's hundred percent legal. You can bring it to me. I can skin out the head and dispose of it properly. And it can come from another state. It can come from another state. Yep. Do you know our? What, we had to what, go online and take a test and everything, and and they make sure basically you're disposing of it properly and you're good to so go. So what do we have to do as hunters to get it to you? Like if somebody stops us coming out of Kansas and they're like, no, 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 it's against the that's a good question. I don't know. Me either. I, I don't. I don't know about that. It, they, they, I would suppose if you told them that you're taking it to a certified taxidermist and yeah. here's, you can ask me and I can send you a little. You'd think picture they would of my tell you that. You know, you know that's got to be a common question. So what do I need to do? Common sense would be like they'd be like, oh, okay, you're good, but I don't hmm. know. Yeah, but it's not really verifiable. <laughs> it's like, oh, don't worry, I'm taking it to a verified source. Well, but, I can send you my license page. Yeah. Yeah. Or my license number yeah, or whatever. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I wonder if guys actually, you know, get caught doing that or. I know? think they did. I like I've heard they... of guys getting caught in PA here. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think a ton of guys it... get caught in retrospect to how many are actually doing it. Yeah. Well, and, and, it... and some of them just don't know. Is dude. it? Yeah. Most I'm sure. Is it once yeah. they just, once they get it to the taxidermist, they're like, Hey, you can't, this can't be here. I don't, I don't know Probably. how that. Yeah. I... I assume a lot of guys just don't know. Yeah. So yeah. this is just, I'm just looking at Kansas because that's what we typically do. Did you find that? Uh, yeah. It says Kansas does not have a carcass transportation ban. Hunters are strongly urged to practice care when moving deer carcasses from place to place. Um, it also says every state has its own regulations around CWD. Most CWD free states prohibit the importation of a whole deer carcass from a known CWD positive state. So like in the case of... Well, those are all see, Kentucky, I guess. So Kentucky, you probably couldn't take a deer from Ohio to Kentucky because Kentucky is a CWD free state at the point at right now. Um, Unless there's a tax term down there that's certified like Trav. Yeah, well, that's what I was trying to see. It says these states usually allow the importation of products such as packaged meat, clean skull plate with antlers, finished taxidermy mounts. Hmm. Um, doesn't really say... See, like Kansas, it says landowners are allowed to bury the carcasses that they generate on their own property. However, guests and friends may not bury the carcasses <laughs> on another person's property. Those who don't own the land, therefore, cannot bury carcasses and are encouraged to contact their county landfill and ask for permission to dispose of the carcass. This is the stuff Makes where nobody's sense. doing. Yeah. Uh, where, <laughs> you know, it. okay, maybe it makes sense. Nobody's doing it. That's my beef with the whole deal is like, even you know they're they're not they're saying don't transport it state to state, but then yet we're still just laying them all over the landscape. Yeah. You know, if we really wanted to stop it, I mean, we'd have to. Seems to me the best move would be just consolidate everything into a certain landfill, or you know, do something like that. Mm. Basically, like Ohio is doing, I think it's great. I think that's a great way of doing it. Yeah. You know, it goes yeah. to certain landfills, and and uh, that's where it's going to stay. Then. Sure. Yeah. Is there CWD testing stuff in Ohio? Yeah, we actually we actually have been saving. You cut out the lymph nodes. Um, we've done hundreds of them for the DNR. Yeah, they come okay. pick them up every once in a while. Um, Are there tech stations they, that just guys take them to? Uh, or is it mainly like through the tax term? I'm sure. I'm sure if you'd call a game warden or whatever, they would be more than happy because I know they the guy that picks them up at my shop there, he drives the roads and looking for dead dead deer. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I guess you know that's one of the things they'll get kind of weirded out and uh you know they'll they'll get hit on the road easy they'll the hunters they'll just kind of walk up to hunters and do weird stuff like that mm -hmm. but um 
I guess that's one of the part that, that's part of the disease. Mm-hmm. They just kind of get dumb. Yeah, but, it, it's so they not get real. Killed on the road. It's not real clear on how that how you do that. <laughs> no, mm. because who, who like did, it, who'd you get certified through? Like who gave you that? The cert- DNR, the DNR, yeah. Ohio DNR. Because like the yeah. and it was an older article it was from like 2018 or something, but it was basically saying I can't do anything in Ohio. Well, obviously I could take that to Trav and he could dispose of it appropriately Mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem very clear and you're for sure i can bring them from out of state to do that yeah i i would yeah i I definitely would for my myself yeah yeah now yeah i mean it makes it makes sense if if there is a certification process for that disposal of it um to your point though like if we're driving it from kansas to ohio you know and you get stopped in illinois then yeah. it's like they're like, well, do you we, have to call every state that you're driving through uh, to like get there? That's yeah. probably what they tell. Well, you. and again, think of the <laughs> n- think of the number of people that are just doing it anyways. Oh yeah, whether they know or not, they're just. Oh, it's more than. 50%. I think most of the laws are are geared towards coming into your state. Mm-hmm. Like so, their laws not are not like, the do transportation. Not bring, do not bring through. it into our state. You know, yeah. not. You know, don't take You're it driving out. Because I guess it is the end game disposal that really could have the sure. imp- not just driving through a state is not going to do anything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Unless you got brains flinging out the window or something. Sure. <laughs> and the Nick's worst out there the worst is the Europeans. brains out. Yeah. You know, because Masturate the brain is before still you leave there. and then just, <laughs> <laughs> I just put a little sprinkle here. Uh huh. Yeah, that'll yeah. do it. Uh-huh. Yeah, Europeans would make Yeah, because I mean we've been we've been acting since I don't know what, twenty 20- 16 or 17 i mean we we bring a skull plate that's clean and we bring we cap them and keep them meat get everything out that's it and the in the hide yeah we don't we don't bring anything else back uh, and it's a pain in the ass normally when we kill one it's like somebody's consumed like the next day doing all of that <laughs> yes but also it's it's nice to you know because it's hard to put a full uh you know something you just cape up to the neck it's hard to get that frozen oh yeah you know so it's it it does simplify things a bit to be able to have, have to cape <laughs> yeah. it and then skull cap it. And then you have the hide on ice. Yeah. In the not, freezer. Not directly on ice. In the freezer. <laughs> Dude, do you remember you, I don't know if you still do this. You used to just put meat right into the cooler, like oh, with yeah. the ice. Yeah. You still do that? No, not as much. <laughs> I, I remember doing that with you yeah. one time. I'm like, this doesn't seem right. It seems like we should use protection. <laughs> yeah. No, no protection. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only sailors use protection. Yeah, we're, we're just raw dogging. We're just raw dogging this meat straight the- <laughs> Yeah, no, we don't. Uh, no, well, because it used to be like, uh, and again, this goes back to like the meat side of things. Just raw dogging them tenderloins right in. Or people, dude. people used to um, put it on ice, and then they put salt in there to draw the blood mm-hmm. out of the meat, and that was like kind of the thing. So that's like how I was raised to do it. Is like, yeah, I would throw it in there with ice, and there'd be some salt on the ice, and it would just. <laughs> Okay, you know, <laughs> pull it out. Yeah, so I don't do that anymore. Pretty wild. But yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, I think the handling of that stuff is probably one of the reasons that we're dealing with CWD at the scale we are right now. It's just people are bringing it back and throwing it in their backyard or it ends up at the landfill or whatever. I wasn't even aware that Kentucky didn't have it. I was kind of under the impression that it's pretty much I'm sure they, now. they I mean, I'm sure they do they just haven't discovered it well dude maybe yeah. I, maybe I should know this but like in the state of Ohio is there regulation around how people dispose of their deer like so when I shoot a deer we don't test it I just bring no. I just bring you the it's caped up to the neck and then we dump the carcass like in a pit yeah yeah I, there's nothing yeah because you know. you're not in the disease surveillance area right so if you were I think there is I think there's a regulation of what you can do with it mm-hmm. but outside of that no, mm-hmm. there's not. Okay. Same with Pennsylvania. Like, there's not really anything. Yeah, Dad'll put them back do. up in the back fence line and shoot coyotes off it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I don't think that there's anything. Well, clearly Kansas has something, you know, to say that they can or can't bury it on their own property or whatever it is, which seems crazy. Yeah. You know. Huh. What is your relation to the landowner? No, you can't bury it here. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, like on public, what are you gonna do? You know, I mean, I assume people are just throwing it in a dumpster if I can get to it or you know what I mean there's just not there's not an organized way to dispose of the stuff I would assume stuff. you can like in Kansas you could quarter it out and leave the, the remnants right on I, public I'm I'm very uh fuzzy on the quartering out rules cuz there are <laughs> states that are super against butchering in the field probably oh. for CWD 
Well, it gets hairy too, as far as like your tag. Like if if that racks go in one place and the meats go in another place and the hides go into a third, it's like mm-hmm. which where does the tag stay? Yes. Well, nowadays it's just a number, you know, so that number right. can be put on anything. I'm really glad you know. that they've done some of that stuff. Like, yeah, it is a very good. Some idea. of the states have really good apps and stuff. I know Kansas mm-hmm. is on point. North North Dakota. North Dakota. Is. I don't know if Ohio, if I think Ohio is now too. It's oh uh, yeah yeah. yeah. I have the a, app. You know, got an app. yeah, I can be in my tree stand and shoot a deer, and I just check it in right it's there. It's just all on there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, dude. North Dakota has the same thing that Pennsylvania does, where you cannot hunt until you ha- they mail you the tag. Oh yeah, same with Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's stupid. Because I can buy it online, but exactly. I don't have my harvest tag yet. That seems wild to me. Like, dude, if you bought it, you should be able to, like, yeah. there should be some process for electronically tagging it or something. Here's a good one for Kansas. An animal taken, this is referred to antlerless tag, but an, an animal taken with an antlerless only permit may be quartered as long as the genitalia is left attached to one of the rear quarters, yeah. leaving the spinal column in the head at the hunting site. I saw Colorado does it too. Yeah. We have kind of a funny story. My, uh, a short one anyways, my dad shot this elk and disregarded that rule. I think if he didn't know, so he just hacked the nuts right off and chucked him down the hill. And uncle Willie, the guy that's at, in yeah. Africa right now, he's like, Dwayne, we're going to need those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to need those. I was just looking, cause there are States that you're not allowed to quarter them. It looks like Ohio. You can. I would guess it's states that are heavy, heavily populated. They don't want stuff laying all over mm-hmm. in the yeah. woods. Maybe Pennsylvania. I don't know. Oh, dude, we should say this before I get off here. It, it's funny, like, the co- the community aspect. Like, when you go into, when I go to your place, like, it's fun because I expect there's guys there always. And, like, yeah. you know, it's fun to, to meet people at the at the shop there and stuff and see what people are killing. And especially if you've got a giant, right? Because you go, most people are bringing, you know, yeah. th- three-year-old deer, whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's fun to have a, a me- always, right? It's Pull on the mega. Yeah. yeah. They're, you know, humbly, they're Everybody. like, what'd you shoot? Like, oh, you know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, since you ask but it was cool that we were down there uh just bsing at one time and i you've got the big rack of antlers uh, skull caps that are just drying out and stuff and i was like yeah. I was like hmm, that one looks pretty familiar yeah. and we pulled it down and sure enough it was that uh what do we call that dude the crumple horn old crumple horn yeah, yeah. that freaking yeah. giant double drop yeah. down with the yeah. big thing it was just right there you know and Probably everybody in the area uses you, right? So you like, can go and there's yeah. sometimes there's deer you see and you, you're like, oh, I think I you know probably that just deer. go in there and be like, eh, yep, yep, that deer's dead. <laughs> yeah. He's not coming back. You got on confirmation you, right? on that. Confirmation. One. It was cool. Yeah. It's cool to hold them though. After you know, yeah. getting trail cam pictures of them and stuff. Yeah. And yeah, that's neat. I mean, it it is a because I mean that's the hardest part. I mean, you know, we like to think as a community, you know, it eventually makes its rounds on stuff, but. You know, some people kill a deer and they could be a mile away and you just, you don't hear about it. You don't know, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you know, being able to have Trav and be like, oh, yep, there he is. Like he's dead. Yeah. You know, it's just There's a lot of stories that got pieced together and like you find out that was the deer that, mm-hmm. you know, you had seen somewhere. Especially in that area because yeah. um, it was like the, was it goose that got killed? Mm-hmm. Like a, pretty far away from your property. Yep. And we end up meeting the guy. Yep. Right. Well, I found out f- through Jed. So, Jed, you know, yeah. just a local contact that talks to people is probably the best way. So he, I knew he got, had gotten killed, uh, but then I just happened to to meet him. It was se- a se- place. Several years later, he was mowing it another bobs. farmers, and <laughs> I didn't know. It was afterwards. Jed's like, "That's the guy that killed goose." I was like, "Yeah, sounds right." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, "Wow." Yeah. You know, the dude didn't have a cigarette leave his lips the entire time we talked to him for yeah. three hours. You know. And it's like, yeah, that's that's the way it goes sometimes. I guess that's the beauty of hunting. Yeah, that's the way never it goes. Know. You never know. Yeah. That's exactly what it comes down to. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a really neat thing. I'm sure it's cool on your side, Trav, just being able to see, you know, there's probably a certain set of deer that you're just like, you're, you're kind of used to seeing. But every once in a while, you get one that comes in, and you're like, damn, that's well, you, you got a cool safe deer. for them, right? Yeah. You, it's you it's amazing. You keep them under lock and key. Like, there's some magnums that come Oh, in. really? Yeah. It's amazing, though, still how rare a truly big buck is. Yeah. Like a 200 inch buck in Ohio is still very rare. How many 200s do you think you've mounted in your life? Uh, I think it's around probably 10 ish, something like that. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Just, usually, usually it's one or two a year. And you have a, a handful of guys that are like bringing giants every year, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, so and where's you know, their property? <laughs> there'll be like one or two two hundred. <laughs> and As the, I just thought maybe we were in the discussion point. It just uh, yeah, like, that's the bad thing. I know, know. How far are they driving it. exactly? Yeah, to get to you. Could you put uh, put a pin right here <laughs> for me? <laughs> no, keep it confidential. But. uh yeah. yeah, it's, it's Taxidermist amazing. Taxidermist confidentiality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Like, you know, you have one or two 200s, and then, you know, between the 180s and 190s. Every year, one or two 200s? It's, that's kind of what it averages at. <sighs> yeah. But then there'll be, like, five in the 180s to 190s, and then from, like, the 160s and 170s, there's a slug of them, you know? Yeah. It's just it's just amazing how it's, even a 180, 190 is rare, but then a 200 is just super all rare. The guy, all the taxidermists yeah. down south listening to this are like, what the hell is he talking about? Yeah. He's like, if I see a 125, I'm like, there yeah. you go, baby. He's like, that, I get a 150 good. once a year, you know? <laughs> yeah. No. yeah, that is nuts to see. What's the biggest you, you think you've seen? Uh, that one that was killed... Well, I won't say where it was killed. It's, it's just, everybody, just a, everybody knows where it was killed, but anyways. It did was you mount that 50 two, cent deer? 50 cent. That's that one that Jed got an arrow in as a three-year-old? It it, it was no, like 214. It's not, no, it's not that one. This one was 268 and something. Whoa. Yeah, or 286. <laughs> 268 or 286. From yeah. Ohio? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Non-typical, I assume. Honestly, like, so there's there's deer that score a lot, and they don't, they look impressive. Obviously, oh, yeah. everybody would look, at them. Ten, look at that Tennessee but, deer, man. Not this a, one had a cage on it. It was just a pretty deer. Yeah. Oh man, is yeah. it a public deer? Like, did people know about it? Or yeah, it's like yeah. a name. A lot deer? of people, a lot of people knew about it. It was shot in. Can town. we look it up, or do you not want to? Yeah, I'll, here, he's he, like he, actually here, yeah, Nick, a picture. Nick can pull it up. Is it like a? Is it a Googleable yeah, image? Just, yeah, Dave Cop. Dave Cop was the guy that killed it. There it is. Oh my God! Wow. Holy jeez. That doesn't even look real, dude. That's a magnum. <laughs> yeah, this the second one up or the the second one in from the left up there. That's here. that's the mount, yeah. Oh my gosh. This is a replica by Antlers by Klaus. We had him on too. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Yeah, that's a that's a mega. Is that from like skinny little scrawny deer too? Like really? not a big deer. I want to say he said it weighed 170. I can pounds. actually tell, yeah. But looking at his, yeah, is, is that um, was that like a bow kill or a gun kill? Yeah, one of the last days of the season. It was in February. Of the archery actually. season. Oh, so yeah. that's why he was all worn out. He said he was freaking out when he grabbed those antlers because he did not. <laughs> can you imagine? If they fall off, you ain't scoring it, you know. Or it's Holy! Geez, it, I mean, I, I don't know. Man. I don't want to know where exactly, but is that like in our vicinity of Ohio? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Recently. Yeah, it was uh, four years ago, maybe five years ago. Wow, that's a super, that's a super giant. Is that dude? Has he brought you a few? Yeah, he's actually. Yeah. He was fairly new at hunting then. I think he had shot one. <laughs> that's my hunter, first deer. <laughs> oh my god! He had shot like a hundred thirty inch buck or something like that before that. But since this, <laughs> he's actually can, bought a property. Can we find out what it scores? Google the score on it. Two seventy eight. Whoa! That's some called unicorn. Yep, Stark County, twenty sixteen. I know it's number four in the state. Yep, I, I saw that somewhere else. Number four? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For non typical. <laughs> bigger than that? Yeah, they killed a 300 in Ohio. Isn't the, it the, the thing baby is, buck? Th- some of the ones that score more than that one don't look as impressive. Yeah. Like, I think that the, is just an impressive looking yeah. deer. Is the baby buck still number one? Google that one. That, that was over 300, wasn't it? Yeah. I want to say that was like. B A T T Y. Did the Deer Society Mike? guys get footage of a 300? I think so. I'm gonna kill one. I don't know if that was in Ohio. Yep. Yep. There you oh, go. Oh, I've seen that picture. Yep. Mike's. Look at the look on his face. <laughs> Looks like a mushroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a 300 inch deer. Yep. Have you seen that giant there six point that scores like 180 or two? 304 and six eights. <laughs> wow. Insane. You know what I'm talking about? That You're giant. There is one? Da- that giant dark six point that's apparently like 180. Yes, the Oklahoma deer. Yeah. What did it score? Was it 200? Uh, I thought it was like 199 or something like that. Can you Google that? <laughs> See if you can find that one. Like, what would you Google there? Giant Oklahoma six point? Yeah, just the Oklahoma six point. 216. Yeah, and you look at something, you're like, where? I mean, it's a giant deer, but where are wow. those inches coming from? Jeez. <laughs> Pull up the antlers by Klaus one. Wow. <sighs> Look at that. Thing. That's just a bull there. It's growing trees. Huh? It's like growing trees. I know, literally. Yeah. 
Hard to believe that's 216. Yeah, but like where from? Though? It's it's I, those little stickers. Like there's a bunch of one inch, two inch sticker type things. You can see them in those pictures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All those little stickers? I guess so. Yeah. Freaking mass on that thing must be ridiculous. Probably like, what, six and three quarter? Oh, dude, I all bet the that's way bigger. Up. Oh, all the way up? Yeah, probably. All the way up? Yeah. Well, he's only got one, two, three, four. Yeah, So, that, but that that third and fourth mass measurement is still huge, even though it's the halfway point there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a giant. What a stud. <laughs> it's crazy, oh, man. It's uh, it, 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 it reminds you they exist out there. You know, even that buck that you killed, I mean, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I was like, is that seven on one side? Yeah. You know, it's just, you don't, you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Remember this, this is Ohio, right? Yep. They found that last Jason, year, two Jason years ago. Jason Herb is that guy's name. You remember oh, okay. that? Okay. Yeah. Remember Jason? Mm -hmm. two, I mean, I, I don't know him personally. Last year yeah. or two years ago, they found that? Yep. Google uh, Jason Herb Buck. J-A-S-O-N. That's, that guy's name's Jason Herb? No. Uh, Jason killed this 193 off of uh herb h e r b uh, e r b yeah. not not herbs <laughs> he killed this buck a long herb before uh, like 10 maybe 10 years ago uh off of uh yep that's it right there this one of these here? yeah you reckon, recognize that shot back there yeah it runs those yeah i think that buck's mounted and runs it is it's i think it's yeah. Is it? like yeah yeah i usually follow runs those just to see what's getting killed that was uh uh right there that's that's silas that's Jed's son. Right here? Yep. Click that picture of the boy. Is it really? Yep. That's hilarious. <laughs> wow. And so that was close to Jed's property? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, that's a monster. <laughs> yeah, out it's, there. Cra it's crazy, the progression. You know, like 10 years ago, it was like, oh, 140-inch buck. That's a pretty, pretty decent one. You were happy with yeah. it. You know, now it's like it's just gradually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Now, I mean, I hear guys passing 160s. Yeah. It's hunting season, boys. Man, big deer. Are cool. Yeah, I freaking killed one. You <laughs> killed one already. Can you believe it? Ah, no, I couldn't. I can't either, dude. It just, I, I described it to Lucas this morning. I was like, dude, it's like ice cream for breakfast. Being able to kill a big buck in September, it's yeah. just like, you know, dessert first. Pretty cool, dude. In the meantime, we'll we'll get him over to Trav and mm -hmm. get him rocking on that. And I won't hold you to it, but what, do you, be a fun one. what do you think? If I get that to you in the next week or so, when, when could we expect to get that back? Usually everything kind of runs six months to a year. Okay. That's typically, okay. yeah. So at the, on the early end, you'll be six months, yeah. Which is brings us to what? So if, say from October 1st, October, November, December, early January, spring, yeah. February, March is the very earliest. Mm -hmm. How Somewhere how many deer there. do you take a year? It depends on the year. Um, like this year, I have a little bit left over from last year, so I'll back it off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we took 220-ish, something like wow. that. Wow. Yeah. Um, Holy cow. Yeah, the year before that, we were a little bit lower, 120s, I, th I think was where I stopped because I had some left over from the year before. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, this year will probably be somewhere between 150 and 200. And I say that, to stop it. just wondering, you know, people listen to this, I'm like, oh, I'll take my deer to trap. First of all, Jared and I have to have room, so back the off, you know. <laughs> uh, you got you to know somebody. Yeah. Uh, but, but also, just from a, a timing sensitivity, I mean, obviously, Ohio is not open yet. Kentucky is. Dakotas are. Like, deer are going to start funneling into you here pretty, pretty quickly. Mm. Um, you know. Are you taking customers or... Like new customers? Not too many new ones this year, probably. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. I, I'll take that's a, few, a good point. I'll take a few early on, maybe, but at some point I will probably have to. You Can know, you make stop. some recommendations? Are there other guys you know could use work, or like what do you suggest, guys? Yeah, do? there's a there's a really good guy just south of me, Matt Sheldon. Um, Mo's Mounts is is what his business is called. It's, he's on Facebook. That'd be a good way to find him. Uh, it's M O E apostrophe S. Mm -hmm. um, Mo's Mounts. But um, he does he does really nice work. Does he say welcome to Mo's? Where is my queso, sir? Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I I know uh, I know he's pretty good. And then yeah, there's there's a few others around. It just depends a lot what price point people want. You know, there's cheap guys, there's expensive guys, and usually I when guys call, I'll give them a cheaper option and then a more expensive option. You know. Yeah. You know that I what would, does that, that come I would down trust. to? As far as price wise, you mean? Yeah. What what would dictate a higher versus lower price point? Uh, just methods. Like a lot of guys in the area will dry preserve, so rub powder on them versus the tanning that cuts a little bit of cost. And you know, um, huh. and I'm not going to bash on those guys because you know there's guys that do not want to pay 
a thousand bucks for a for a mount, mm-hmm. which that's I think that's around what what Matt's gonna. He's told me he's gonna be a thousand to twelve hundred. I think on a mount. Oh wow. Um, you're not quite there, yeah. right? You, no, no, no I'm se- at seven fifty this year. Yeah, yeah. 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 It seems crazy because I remember at one point, you know, was it twenty years ago, three fifty for yeah. shoulder Yeah, mount? they've gone up for sure. Probably. You do, well, you're doing more of them and bigger. Yeah. I would say on the cheaper end now, if you find somebody for five fifty to six hundred, that's kind of cheap, cheaper. Yeah, cheaper. Yeah, not the mm-hmm. cheapest, but what are we looking at ballpark for a pedestal? Eight eight twenty five to eight fifty, okay. depending on which. Oh, that's like, not much. Yeah, more than a yeah, that's shoulder mount. Usually about seventy five bucks more. Yeah. Oh wow. Because yep. I mean, it is essentially a shoulder, mount. and that's not including the pedestal and the habitat. Usually, I price them separately. Right. So basically, a pin pedestal will be you know that price. And a then, pin pedestal. So where does that start? Like, w- would you say that price would typically include that steel that I'm talking about? Yep. yep. And so, so since I'm providing my own barrel, yep, that's what. Can I just at. pick it up from you, just the mount and the steel, and then I'll I'll screw it into the barrel probably. Yep. You That'll can do work it that way. Yep. Or you can bring the barrel out, and I can make sure everything's level for you. Um, that's okay. usually kind of a good idea. Okay. Um, just because if I just, you can shim them up. That and barrel's a freaking yeah. pain to mm-hmm. move, but <laughs> if you want it, I'll bring it. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's it's up, it up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know like pedestals and habitat, you know, obviously have a cost on, on them on top of that. Cause I think most of mine ran, I don't know, 1200 to 1400 yeah. or something, maybe Dude, with I th- all the habitat I, and I, pedestal stuff. Yeah, 1500. That's, that's pretty much an average. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I can't believe my dad didn't do a pedestal on that big eight. I really tried to talk him into it. I was like, dude, do you understand what you got here? I was like, this is, and he's like, no. Oh. Yeah, that's when your mom was like slapping me when he said, uh, well, yeah, I want to do a pedestal. I was like, yeah, it'd be great right there. And she's like, shut your mouth. You're not yeah. going to eat tonight. Yeah. Margie's not happy. About, Sorry. About the pedestal thing. So it might end up what in my office. What do you mean she's office. not happy? Oh, she's, you know. <laughs> I think the double pedestals look really cool. Double and triple. Listen, if you're going to go single, we should probably go double then, Margie. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Her thing is just the separation of rooms. She doesn't want them in every room, which I I get it. It's fine. (laughs) Because I have them now in our living room, right? Uh So Uh eventually, you know, I'll do, if we ever build a house or something, I'll do, I have one in my office. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I am heading south and east for elk yeah thanks for coming out man yeah we appreciate, appreciate it, it Trav. my pleasure thanks yeah. thanks for bringing my bucks i'm excited yep. to get those back up on the wall and add to it this year hopefully nothing, we got one nothing better than taxidermy day dude it's no, like Christmas. No, getting out no, there is nothing better than taxidermy day it's the bill a lot of people like to pay that's what they tell me yeah um, i don't even pay attention to it it's just send me the invoice yeah. pay it here you there go. go so yeah we got one one down this year and so it's, far it's only September, September what eighth? Whacked him on September sixth, like and we're just getting Holy rolling cow. here. That's September eighth, man. You already killed a deer. That's crazy. I know. It's like ice cream for breakfast. Yeah, it's good. Good for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good for the soul. <laughs> on to the next one, hopefully. Yeah, for sure. Well, Trav, we appreciate you coming down, and uh, not super confident on our podcast, but there's a good chance people are going to call you. Just don't choke Jared and I out on our repeating customer <laughs> side um, and don't fill our spots either. yeah but uh you got room for ours but yeah no we appreciate you coming down and and your attention to the to the taxidermy that we bring you and you know it, it lets us rekindle those memories all the time when we get to look at them so we love being able to get to promote you too like to anybody that asks you know just, mm. dude, i wouldn't take it anywhere else but you know as long as you're taking them you know i know there's there's other great places too so mm-hmm. you're our guy though for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah you're for our sure. guy yeah yeah word of mouth yeah it's it can go fast <laughs> yeah That's for sure no it's yep. it definitely does so well cool man well we appreciate you coming down and and chiming in and uh have a safe trip out west when you when you head out for elk Thank here you. and yep, keep us nice. posted on punching tags out there and hopefully we're in contact more over the next couple months you know trav listens yeah. to every one of our podcasts do you yeah like, it actually I, I love listening to podcasts. He's like, I have so all I'm these hours listening. to burn while I'm sitting there mounting yep. deer. Yeah. Like, they're running. Not? They're running. I couldn't believe When you told me that, I was like, are you serious, dude? Like, that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm playing catch up a little bit after Alaska. I'm playing catch up. Well, we've had a yeah. few like three hour bangers here, and people. Hey, those are the ones I like because, yeah. you know, that'll, yeah. that'll burn a whole morning that'll, right there. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, well, cool, no, man. No, we're going on two and 45 years. So. There you go. Well, yeah, dude, we appreciate it. And uh, yeah, keep us posted on things. And, and thanks for being our guy. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for the work. Later. It's taking me.